Okay, whatever they are. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Let me first thank the organizers for the invitation and organizing this very nice workshop and all the social events and for provi providing a very nice weather as well. Uh, so last year in Corfu, I gave a talk about uh, how to construct these braided non commutative field theories. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, we sort of uh, understood how to perform a proper way of quantization because that's a very non trivial thing, or at least we think we know how to quantize them properly. So I will speak about that work, and the work is done in collaboration with uh, Richard Savo and his uh, former PhD student Grigorios Yotopoulos, and also with my colleagues from Belgrade, Voya Radovanovic, Nikola Konik, and Nisha Toman. And uh, the last part about quantization is still in preparation. It's almost finished. We got stuck with the uh, with spinors. We tried the uh, uh, electrodynamics coupled to a spinor field, and then we got stuck with all the signs in various operators, BVs, and so on. So that part is still uh, under construction, but I think it's uh, more or less uh, more or less finished. Okay, anyhow, I start briefly with the motivation. I will skip the general motivation because it's the last day of this workshop and we are more or less well motivated to do some kind of non-commutative geometry. And just briefly mention the original motivation by Heisenberg who uh, originally thought that it's a good idea to introduce non-commuting coordinates in order to regular, regularize the uh, electron self uh, energy which was divergent. So that was the original motivation. And nowadays we know, and we have seen through the workshop that quantization of non-commutative field theories introduces all sorts of new things, among other things, also UV IR mixing. And uh, we have seen this example of the scalar field, five to the four interaction written with the Moyal veil star product that was the, 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 the usual one that is also motivated from string theory and so on. And uh, the, the fact, well, I'll just repeat shortly because we have seen the problem, like I, like I have said. Uh, so the, because of this star product interaction, there are two types of uh, diagrams, planar diagrams and non-planar diagrams, because it, when you calculate like the two point function, then it depends how you contract your momenta because of the non-commutativity, it's not the, it, the, the order somehow matters and you end up with non-planar diagrams as well. So the planar diagrams uh, behave in the usual way. They, gave, they give just the usual commutative result, which is UV divergent. So no improvement there. On the other hand, the non-planar diagrams, they give a result that is more or less like a commutative one, but has this uh, exponential factor, which is oscillating because uh, theta is a non-commutativity parameter uh, in the commutative limit, it goes to zero. P is the external momenta, K is the momenta running in the loop, so to say. Uh, so this diagram is UV finite because of this oscillator factor, unless you put your theta to zero or you take a very small external moment of P to zero or both of them. In that case, the exponential factor vanishes and you end up with the usual UV divergent diagram. And that was termed the UV IR mixing and was first shown in this paper by Minvala Ram, Ram, Ramsnot and Seibert. And there are, like we have seen through the workshop, various comments on various people worked on this issue starting from the beginning of 2000 and so on. Like uh, uh, Baal was mentioning Dorothea Banks and the Fedenhagen and Roberts were showing that if you take the, if you define, try to define your non-commutative quantum field theory properly on this uh, Moyal Veil plane, then some issues are not there among other things, probably UVIR mixing and also issues with the unitarity. If you have space-time non-commutativity, this all, this all, that all depends how you define your quantum field theory and if you really try to define it axiomatically properly. In any case, what, was, uh, uh, what has been done in, uh, in the, like 2003, 2004, more or less, is the model of uh, Harald Ross and Raymond Wolkenhardt, which is a modification of this five to the four scalar field theory and modification is in this oscillator term, which now uh, sort of combines uh, small scales and large scales because of this one over theta and X. 
And that model was shown to be uh, completely UV finite, renormalizable, even, even it behaves better than the usual five to the four commutative uh, scalar field theory. And uh, then what happened afterwards, I did not write it, but we'll mention it during the talk, uh, starting from 2005. And then on people started also looking at this, uh, at the twist formalism and the application of twisted uh, space-time symmetries or the quantum field theory, like Balat Chandran was doing that. And, and uh, other people like Gaetano and Julius also. And uh, they realized that there also uh, there might happen that the UVR mixing is not present if you you twist your uh, if you twist the statistics you twist twist the Hilbert space or depending on what you twist whether you twist the uh, twist the plane wave so to say or the statistics it might happen that there is no UVIR mixing so there were various discussions as I said in the in the two thousand about these issues and uh, my talk in my talk we will yet another version of all this and i will show how our python because i will speak also about the scalar field theory how it how it is different from all these approaches so to say uh, the other problem with the renormalization are gauge theories because whatever people have done so far that i know of in the star product approach uh, there is no renormalizable model of uh, gauge theories because people tried adding an oscillator term also to to the gauge theories we saw in the talk of, of Carmelo Martin that also if you do this uh, theta exact cyber glitter map, he also ended up with you so somehow some sort of UV are mixing. Yes, uh, it's not correct. Okay, I'm not talking about matrix models. I said the star product approach. So if uh, okay. okay, it's not supersymmetric. So far, it, there's no supersymmetry. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, like I will probably miss, uh, no, not probably for sure. I'm missing the references and please uh, add whatever you think it's appropriate. I, I apologize for two people who I'm not going to mention or I forgot or I don't know. Uh, th th there is a statement about gauge theories and Carol says it, if it's supersymmetric, okay, sorry. So I did not, I was not, so the, the, this talk will be non-supersymmetric <laughs> in this respect. Okay, so uh, for sure I know that if you add an oscillator term to gauge theories, non-supersymmetric, it's non-renormalizable. Also the, in the discussion of this twisted symmetries, uh, gauge symmetry somehow spoils things and you're not sure what to do exactly with this. And in that respect also we are going to, well, I'm going to present a, a way to quantize. Uh, okay, we'll end up, we'll see that the result is not really what we hoped for, but let's see. The, the, Uh, it, it will not be renormal, renormalizable, <laughs> but I'm going to show, well, at least the pre preliminary results suggest that we also get UV IR mixing for the U1 couple two spinners. But uh, I will come to that at, at the end of the talk. So this is a brief, uh, brief motivation, what I'm going to talk about. And then the, the approach that, that I'm going to discuss is based like on three three main, uh, so to say, three main formalisms. One is the introduce, the, how, to, how we introduce the deformation, how we define our non commutative space time. And for that, we use the principle twist formalism. Uh, we use it to deform the underlying space time symmetry and then define all the module algebras like uh, Andre Borowitz was describing in his talk. So I will just very briefly speak about the Dreamfield twist formalism. That's a way to introduce the deformation. Then uh, how do we construct non-commutative field theories? And we call them braided non-commutative field theories. We use the L infinity algebra approach. And uh, this is the part that I spoke last year in Corfu about. And uh, the, I will speak about L infinity in more details. Uh, the, so somehow two, major points about L infinity algebras are the papers of uh, Olaf Holm and uh, Twibach in 2017. And they showed, the, well, they showed that any classical, classical field theory, whether it, has, whether it has gauge symmetries or not, can be described by the corresponding L infinity algebra. And also this correspondence was more developed in uh, papers by Branio and Christian and the others using the duality between L infinity and the BV formalism. And then we also, tried to apply uh, this construction to the non-commutative field theories and 
ended up with a braided LSMSE algebra and braided non commutative field theories in uh, these to say, series of papers. And the final thing that concerns quantization is the BV4 application of the BV formalism and homological perturbation theory, but now everything braided. So that's uh, a bit deformed, so to say. It's an algebraic technique to, to, for quantization. And uh, in, the, in, uh, in their paper, Richard and Alex and Hans, I think it's uh, uh, generalized this uh, braided BV formalism to fuzzy sphere and fuzzy torus. And we are now trying to apply it for usual quantum field theories like scalar field theory and the other, and gauge field theories. So these are three major major formalisms that I'm going to use. This is the outline motivations motivation we talked about. Tools I described what I'm going to talk about, and then finally the examples I will speak about the braided phi to the fourth theory and braided electrodynamics at the end. For the braided electrodynamics, I will just probably show the results. Uh, the non commutative geometry via the twist deformation. So, this is the first, first tool that we are going to need. Was like I said, was described in the talk by Andre Borovic. So, I will not spend too many details on this. Uh, in any case, we start with a symmetry algebra. G could be like our space time symmetry algebra if we are on Minkowski, could be Poincare algebra or a subgroup of it, or could be like uh, if we are in the theater or anti the theater could be x so to two, three, one, four, depends on your dimensions and so on. And then it's universal covering algebra. UG is the, is the Hopf algebra, has a structure of a Hopf algebra, and we define a twist operator in the sense of Greenfield, like an element that lives in double copy of the env uh, enveloping algebra and has to fulfill the co cycle condition which ensures the associativity of later on star products and so on. And we always demand that this twist operator, which encodes the deformation starts with a unity, which means, and has higher order terms in the deformation parameter, which is here labeled by H. Uh, that means that we always have a commutative limit on the control. We just put H, H goes to zero and deformation vanishes. So in this respect, all our models will have a good commutative limit. Uh, the twist introduces the R matrix, like Andre was saying, and we will always work uh, with a triangular R matrix, meaning this, the, this R to one is R to the minus one. And then the prescription is as follows. We have um, symmetry, our original symmetry, space time symmetry or whatever. We twisted it, we end up with the twisted symmetry of algebra. Then we have module algebras. So th these are the spaces that our symmetry algebra acts on, like field functions, what differential forms, whatever you want. And they become star module algebras in the sense that uh, in these algebras, like A and B are elements of the algebra, we have a product in this algebra. We deform this product using the twist formalism. We compose it with the inverse of the twist and we obtain the star product. This star product is non commutative, but the non commutativity is controlled by the R matrix. So the only thing that you somehow should remember from this slide is that all our products are now will become star products. They will be non commutative, uh, but the non commutativity will be in this R matrix, and we know how to construct it. So, whether it's a product between functions or a wedge product between forms or, or a Lie bracket, a product between vector fields, it will become a star product and it will be, we call this braided non commutative because our braiding is controlled by the R matrix. The well known example of Moyal twist, you choose the twist to be composed of your translation operators, for example, here the partial derivatives. And the star product is the usual moyal veil star product. This is, this is just the first order expansion and the R matrix. So basically R matrix encodes non-commutativity. And this will be our general prescription how we deform everything, including the L infinity algebra. So that's the first, first part, first tool, so to say. Then L infinity algebra, the second thing that we are going to need and here I will spend more time describing them because we haven't, there were one or two talks, there was a talk from Rano and there was another talk speaking about uh, maybe symmetries in uh, closed spring or so of Virazoro, also speaking a bit about L infinity algebra, but I will, I will spend more time on this. So originally L infinity algebra or strong homotopy algebra, uh, well in physics, they appeared in the, in various uh, various uh, fields, so to say, they appeared in uh, higher spin gauge theories, where people realized that if you make a, if you compose two gauge transformations, then the the resulting transformation depends is field dependent. So na a natural 
natural way to describe this is using the L infinity. Well, what I did not say is that L infinity are generalization of a Lie algebra. They allow for higher brackets. So in the Lie algebra, you have just the commutator. And in the L infinity, you allow for three brackets, four brackets, and so on. In principle, we could have infinitely many. And then therefore that it's convenient to describe the uh, highest spin gauge theories. Then it came out that they are symmetries of uh, closed string field theory because there are higher brackets there. And that was shown in the work of Zwiebach. And then, like I said, in the beginning, all classical field theories can be described by a corresponding L infinity algebra. And then there's, there's a very nice duality between L infinities and the BV formalism. Uh, concerning non-commutative gauge field theories, the, somehow uh, they, they were first studied in the context of L infinity in the papers by the Muni group, Charles Blumenhagen, Vlad Kuprianov, and the others. Uh, and the idea was, since we know that the non-commutative gauge theories depend uh, again how you define them, I'm not going to talk about matrix models. It's just the star product approach that I'm describing here. Uh, there, are, there could be higher brackets, and we saw in the cyber written map you have to go to the enveloping algebra that it might fit in the language of the L infinity algebra because of these higher structures. And uh, so in this paper by Blumenhagen and the others, it was shown that for a Kontievich star product, you could construct the corresponding L infinity algebra step by step. They call it the boot bootstrap method. Uh, what we do so related with their work or thinking of our, our own, our original idea was basically to start with a non-associative uh, field theory or gravity with, the, with this R flux uh, deformation. And we thought L infinity could be a, a good way to study this, but then we ended up studying first the classical and cartan gravity because we realized that there is no L infinity algebra written for the gravity in the first order formalism. And then we also moved to the non-commutative gravity and field theory. And that is uh, that's what I'm going to talk ab about in, the, in what follows more or less. Okay, so uh, let me just briefly introduce the classical L infinity algebra. Uh, you don't see it here, but it's uh, uh, that graded vector space, which we label with capital V, and it's a sum of uh, V1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, whatever, however. And these are, grade un uh, so these are graded vector spaces. And there are brackets, which are multilinear, and they are graded, anti-symmetric, and they map an element of this V space to, to the V space again. And so th this is the graded anti-symmetric property of the bracket. When you commute two elements, you end up with a minus and the sign depends on the grading of the elements. The brackets are not arbitrary. They fulfill homotopy relations. And I just wrote the first three homotopy relations and then there are higher, in, in principle, infinitely many. So L1, the first bracket has to square to zero. And that tells us that this uh, whole space V with L1 is a co-chain complex. Then there is the L2 bracket with, combined with L1. And this homotopy relation tells us that, that the L1 is, uh, fulfills the Leibniz rule or is a derivation of L2 if you want. So you apply it on L2 and then it just get the usual Leibniz rule with a, with a graded Leibniz rule with the appropriate sign. Then there is a, so these two are sort of normal. They appear in the ordinary Lie algebra, uh, more or less. Uh, the third one uh, also encodes the, the L3 bracket, which is sort of a new object. And then it has like two parts. Uh, the last two lines, they involve only L2 brackets and they are uh, sort of a Jacobi identity for L2 brackets. And the first two lines, they have L1 and L3. So they tell you that Jacobi, Jacobi or Jacobi identity is fulfilled up to a homotopy. So if, if there is no L3 bracket, then the Jacobi identity will be valid. If there is an L3 bracket, then it will be violated up to this, uh, these brackets up to homotopy and so on. So this, the, this is the structure we have. We have the space, so we have brackets, we have uh, homotopy relations between brackets, so they're not arbitrary. And in addition, so this, normally we could stop here because this is, this is enough to construct a field theory in the sense of having uh, gauge symmetry and the equations of motion. If we want to construct an action, then we need uh, an additional structure which is called a pairing. It has to be non-degenerate bilinear pairing of a degree, usually three, this, this I did not write. And it takes uh, two copies of your vector space, gives a number. And uh, in, mo in most of the cases, or in the cases that I'm going to speak about, this pairing will be an integral basically. So 
the pairing tells you how to how to construct an action basically from from your from your field uh, it has to be cyclic so the 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 property it is written here so if you want to cyclically commute this field uh in the pairing and under the bracket then this is fulfilled there is a complicated sign but we usually know how to calculate it so this uh, pairing is an additional structure does not have to be there but if you want to have an action principle then then you have to then you need a pairing and since we are going to talk about the quantization we usually need an action principle so we have to introduce the pairing uh how is it used in uh, construction of gauge field theories so uh, we start with a space that has uh, four, uh, four, four spaces with uh, four different spaces, V1, V, uh, V0, V1, V2, and V3. And then we say that in V1, we put gauge parameters, if we have a gauge symmetry, then in, uh, in V0, sorry, in V1, we put gauge fields or only fields if there is no gauge symmetry, well, all the fields, gauge fields, meta fields, whatever they live in V1. Equations of motion live in V2, and the second letter identity is uh, second second letter because we have a gauge symmetry, it's a local symmetry, so we don't have a first letter identity, which is a conservation law, but we have a second letter identities, or sometimes called Bianchi identities, and they are relations between uh, equations of motion. They live in V3. How do we uh, how do we use this? Then we we say the gauge transformations can be written like a, an infinite sum of L brackets, and they start with L one of uh, rho gauge parameter, then L two of rho and a entire brackets depends on what you have. And here we are we choose sort of gauge transformations that are linear in the gauge parameter. Could be probably more complicated, but but for whatever we have done, it's only this thing, so it's always linear in the gauge parameter. Equations of motion are written in the similar way, like an infinite sum of L brackets, but they only depend on the gauge field. They start with uh, L1 of A and then higher brackets. The action is written using the, the pairing. So again, it's an infinite sum of the pairing of the field with the corresponding brackets. And then the letter identities can be written in this way. And uh, if, uh, if we have the cyclic structure, then usually natural identities follow from the action from just the variation of the equations of motion first follow from the variation of principle and the cyclicity of this pairing so one can write the variation of action in this way and then also the second natural identities follow from there if this variation is just a, is the symmetry the gate variation so if you have a gauge symmetry, then there is V0 and V3. If there is no gauge symmetry, like in the case of the scalar field, it will only be V1 and V2. There's the space of field and the equations of motion, more or less. So uh, how does it work on an example? So let's look at the non-abelian uh, three-dimensional Kern Simons. So we have gauge parameters that are valid in a, valued in a Lie algebra. TA is the generators of the Lie algebra. We have gauge field that is also val valued in the Lie algebra, and the FA are equations of motion or field strength tensor, however you want to call it. Then uh, the non-vanishing brackets are these, uh, and then two brackets. And the, uh, in the case of Trent Simons, we end up with L2 brackets. There are no higher brackets. And then these brackets really reproduce us the gauge trans usual gauge transformation. So we start with L1 of rho and L2 of rho and A, and we end up with the usual gauge transformation. The closure of a gauge transformation is encoded in this L2 of two gauge parameters. The equation of motion, which in the case of turn time, well, the, the, this is just the FA equation of motion is uh, putting this equal to zero. Uh, and this is just the usual turn time equation of motion. The, this thing says that uh, FA transforms covariantly, and the second letter identity is just the Bianchi identity for FA, and the action is just the usual Chern Simons action, or written with a cyclic pairing and corresponding brackets. Uh, for other examples, uh, like Young Mills theory, we were, in the case of Young Mills, since we have, uh, maybe I can say it here. So L1 brackets of A encode the free theory, so to say. Interactions are encoded in higher brackets, L2, L3, and so on. L2 encodes uh, the triple interaction, L3 encodes uh, quartic interaction, and so on. In the case of Young-Mills, we have triple and quartic interactions, so there will be also L3 brackets appearing. Uh, in Charles Simons, it's simple. We only have L2 brackets, and this is the triple interaction that we have. 
And now the question is, how do we deform this? Well, we apply the twist formalism to all this. So the idea is like I showed on one of the first slides, we just compose all the maps with the inverse of the twist. And in this way, we start with the, the same space that we had. We have our original L brackets, and now we apply the twist, the inverse of the twist to them. And we end up with star brackets that are now they are graded, anti-symmetric and uh, graded, and but braided also. There, there is an R matrix. When you permute two elements, then uh, there is a sign and so on, but there is also an R matrix appearing here. So this is how it's uh, done consistently. And then it, an example for, for the Chen Simons gauge theory, let's say you look at the L2 bracket, which gives you the commutator of the gauge parameter and the gauge field. This bracket is now deformed if you apply consistency the inverse of the twist. The inverse of the twist enters into this bracket, and this bracket is now braided antisymmetric. When you now permute rho and a, you will end up with a, an R matrix. And what is nice, this is a sort of one of the new, new nice features that we that we get in this braided non-commutative theories is that this bracket really closes in the Lie algebra. When you write explicitly what this is, and you calculate it in terms of your uh, fields and gauge parameters and the corresponding uh, original gauge, uh, gauge, or gauge group or gauge generators of the gauge group, it comes out that this really closes. And that's, uh, that's different than the case that we had in talk of Carmelo Martin, where he was discussing, uh, I think he discussed the, the cyber written theory and the gauge transformations were defined with this star commutator, which is uh, maybe I can just shortly write here. Yep. Do you see if I write here? So, like we have commutator, what usually people do, they define this commutator a star b, which is a star b minus b star a. And this is really anti-symmetric and that's nice, but if A and B are, are valued in the Lie algebra, this, this will not close in the Lie algebra. On the other hand, what we do with this twist formalism is, and we write it differently, we put star here, is something that is A star B, if you write it explicitly, minus R matrix, uh, I wrote it like a, acting on B star R acting on A. And this thing is not A star, it's not the commutator of B and A. So it's not anti-symmetric, it's, anti it's braided anti-symmetric in the sense that there is an R matrix there. But the good thing is that it really closes in the Lie algebra. So the gauge theory is going to be different. We don't really need to extend our gauge algebra to the enveloping algebra and then think about uh, new degrees of freedom or introduce the cyber written map and so on. So this is this is like the first plus that we get uh, in this, this approach. Okay, that, that, that is what I wanted to advertise somehow here to motivate all this brackets and stars and so on. Uh, the homotopy relations also change and the change is only visible in the third, starting from the third homotopy relation and so on. First two, they remain uh, the same. So L1 still squares to zero, L1 is still a derivation of L2. In the L, L uh, in the, in the, in the homotopy relation with L3, there are R matrices now appearing in the, the, in the part that encodes the Jacobi identity. So it's sort of a braided Jacobi identity up to a homotopy. So you see when you uh, change the, 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 the places of elements, there is an R matrix. So that is sort of new. And then also the pairing, since we would like to have an action and discuss uh, usual field theory, then we have to define a, a proper pairing and the pairing is also defined the, by starting with the classical and composing it with inverse of the twist. And we end up with a pairing that is a braided cyclic. So if you commute V1 and V2, you end up with an R matrix, but that's not very good if you want to have uh, equations of motion. In order to derive the equations of motion from the action and use the variational principle, we really need a strict cyclicity. Otherwise we cannot really uh, derive the equations of motion. So we demand that this is really strict cy strictly cyclic, or that is that this R matrix vanishes. And to do this, we have to then restrict our choices of the twist. So we only choose the twists that give us this pairing to be strictly cyclic. And it's really in the language of the field theory and the integrals, 
it's the same as saying that we are going to work with integrals that are cyclic under the corresponding star product. So that's that property. And that restricts us uh, the, the choices, possible choices of uh, the Drinsel Swiss that we are going to use, but still it's uh, something to, we can work with. And then we end up with strictly cyclic braided L infinity algebra. How do we deform a braided field theory using this? Yes. Well, Moyal Veli, for example. So if uh, the twist has to, like uh, Moyal Veli for sure, so it's a good twist if you look it in the terms, uh, you have to define what your pairing is. So if you are not, want to do normal field theory, like uh, scalar field theory or uh, U1 or whatever, you write an integral. And, and the pairing is the integral defined properly, uh, then Moyal Veil is fine. Um, uh, there are other twists uh, or any abelian twist will work in the, because. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, pairing is a general one. In our particular examples, pairing will be the integral. So pairing, uh, because uh, like in the examples of fuzzy sphere, fuzzy torus that Alex and Richard and Hans were discussing, pairing is a trait on something, whatever. Depends on your concrete example of field theory you want to construct somehow. I don't know if I can say it more precisely. If you have any questions, like, I, so pairing is a general structure that you put on algebraically on your L infinity, it has to fulfill these properties, has to be cyclic and so on. You need cyclicity to, der to derive the equations of motion from the action defined in this way. And then on the concrete examples, or the concrete examples that you want to discuss, your pairing has to be, has to relate uh, like elements from V0 and V3, V1 and V2, uh, meaning that if when you make a variation uh, in the fields, you end up with the equations of motion. And then you, for, for specific field theories, you say it, it's an integral defined in such a way or it's a trace defined in such a way. So you just make a, realize it in a concrete example. Okay, uh, field theory, braided field theory. So we use the same formulas that we, that we had before. Just put all the stars in the, in the brackets and we end up with the braided gauge transformations like this, and they will close in the Lie algebra if, the, if we, we started, we start with the uh, Lie algebra by itself because of this property braided equations of motion. Uh, in the case of Chen Simons, we end up with this for a braided equation of motion where this commutator is now this braided commutator. It's not anti-symmetric, it's braided anti-symmetric and it this really stays in the Lie algebra. Does not, we don't, it does not go out of the, the original Lie algebra. The braided matter identity is a bit less straightforward because, because, uh, because it cannot really be derived from an action. It's a combination. It turns out that one can derive it as a combination of homotopy relations. And the fact is it's not, uh, it's no longer linear in the equations of motion. So it's, or it's, it's not homogeneous. So it starts like L1 of equations of motion and L2, but then there are higher terms that do not involve really equations of motion or this element from V2, but only fields. So it's a, so it's a deformed, definitely, definitely deformed braided, braided matter and its identity. In the case of Chen Simons, you see, because this first three terms, they're just the usual one. Is if, you, if you take a commutative limit, this first three, two, three terms, they produce the usual Bianchi identity for FA, and this one vanishes in the commutative limit. However, it's there uh, in the, the non-commutative deformation of the braided Chen Simons. But the problem with the natural identity is the fact that, let me see, the braided gauge transformations do not obey the usual Leibniz rule, but they obey the braided Leibniz rule. And in this way, they are uh, different than the variational principle. So you cannot really combine the variational principle and the braided gauge transformation to derive the, the natural identity from, the, from an action. That's a bit of a problem. Uh, and that is why uh, one has to construct it really as a combination of homotopy relations and check if everything is consistent and that, that we have done. And there is a closed formula, well, not closed, but the for formula up to any other in this L bracket. Uh, 
and that it, if it works, it's just you cannot really derive it from an action because of this braided Leibniz rule. So this is a summary of the term Simons. Uh, the action, the you, well, the action once you. Uh, so here is the, the example of the of the integral or, or the pairing. Oh, okay. I'm going to speed up the just for Paolo. Uh, the pairing now in this case has has an integral and also has a trace over the gate group. So you have to define it in this, this way. Uh, give the the, so the the proper equations of motion and so on. And uh, I commented on the on the second letter identity. And let's say that it's concerning the braided gauge theories. How do we quantize them? Here I'm going to be very very brief let's say because i have only 10 minutes more so the idea is uh, is uh, is more or less this we start uh, we use the algebraic techniques and we follow the approach again from Brano, christian and the others using the duality between the vv formalism and the approach of costello and william and uh, what uh, richard alex and hans did uh, last year is to uh, generalize these approaches to the fuzzy sphere and fuzzy torus. So these are also braided field theories, they are finite, but then they, uh, they realize how to, uh, how to extend the BV formalism and the homological perturbation theory to the braided case. And then we were just trying to generalize it to usual ordinary quantum field theories on Minkowski. Uh, we start, let's say, we start from our favorite L infinity algebra with braided L infinity algebra with the space bracket pairing, and then we should discuss observables, and then we have to extend this structure to the symmetric algebra because we usually we are uh, interested in calculating correlation functions or some scattering amplitudes and so on. So we need polynomials of, of fields more or less. And that is why we, in the first step, we have to extend our L infinity to the symmetric, full symmetric algebra. And uh, maybe I skip this. I just say that this step is sort of analogous uh, to the step when you want to extend the ordinary matrix Lie, gauge Lie algebra to the space of differential form. So it's just uh, how do you how do you extend this the, the notion of this commutator to the space of differential form? So it's more or less like this: How do you extend the brackets? from the original space to the full symmetric algebra, and also you have to extend the pairing. So this is the first step. Using this uh, symmetric algebra, you can construct the full BV action. And this BV action has a zero, uh, has the, the, includes the free theory and the interacting theory. And then uh, it also defines a bracket. I'm not going to discuss properties of this bracket. And uh, anyhow, you can construct the uh, uh, algebra of classical observables, which is the symmetric algebra. And, uh, your uh, uh, Q of this bracket and the Q operator, which is defined with L1, which includes the free theory and interacting theory from the BV action. How do we quantize this? We have to introduce the BV Laplacian, which encodes basically the, we'll see the braided weak theorem. And then we construct the full BV operator with the L1 encodes the free theory. S interaction encodes interactions and we'll get vertexes from there and the BV Laplacian encodes the quantization and we get weak theorem from there. There are all sorts of properties of these maps uh, and uh, I'll skip them for the moment. Uh, we can discuss this later. Anyhow, I'll repeat once again, the braided BV Laplacian will give us the braided weak theorem and in S interaction will give us interactions. So how is it done? We use the homological perturbation theory and homological perturbation lemma. And uh, these, these, these pictures more or less Branya showed in his talk. And now maybe, maybe I just, uh, I, made, I showed them here. So we start with our usual L infinity algebra. In V1, we have fields. In V2, we have sort of equations of motion and L1 goes between V1 and V2 gives us equations of motion of, uh, of fields. Uh, then we have an inverse of L1, which is this small h, and we call it contracting homotopy, and that basically encodes propagators. Then from V1, we can make a projection to the space of physical fields, meaning fields that fulfill equations of motion, modulo gauge transformations if we have a gauge symmetry. So this is this P projection. There is an inverse, inverse, uh, inverse map, but for the moment, I don't care about it. So uh, the projection is important because it takes us to the space of physical fields and H is important because that gives us propagators. And all this structure we have to now, so this is on the original L infinity algebra, we have to go to the symmetric algebra which, which encodes our observables and then 
the perturbation, we have to perturb the free theory using adding this BV Laplacian and interaction action. And then the homological perturbation lemma tells us how to calculate green, or how to calculate this deformed projection, which takes us, uh, which gives us basically the green functions if you want. So this is the, the green function uh, calculated with this perturbed projection. And it, this is this object here. This delta functions just stay in places of the physical field, so to say. Uh, and this expression we are going to use to calculate the uh, green functions for the free th theory where this delta is just the BV Laplacian and for the interaction, uh, interacting theory where this delta is uh, BV Laplacian plus interaction action. So this is our so to say, key formula and uh, these maps we know how to calculate. The scalar field theory, do I still have five minutes or no? Okay. Scalar field theory, it, uh, it only has like V1 and V2 and has two brackets, L1 that encodes free theory and L3 that encodes interaction. Uh, the, pairing, uh, the pairing is the integral, usual phi, phi plus are, are the, the, the elements living in V2. So this is the classical theory, we braid it, put stars everywhere. This is the, the action for the braided scalar field theory and it's the same like the usual phi to the fourth. So there are no new things there. What is new is the application of the L infinity approach. So uh, ignore the map, doesn't matter. In the case of free theory, because of the, this BV Laplacian that is now also braided, BV Laplacian, we end up with the two, well, two point function is just the usual propagator, but the four point function encodes the braided weak theorem. So we get our matrices here when we consistently apply all these techniques. And uh, in the case of the interacting theory, we have to construct, construct this L interaction as interacting action using the extended L infinity algebra. And that's a really something new because we were stuck with these things until we realized that. And then the interaction and point function, we just apply formulas and we end up with a two point function at one loop, which is completely classical. So there are no non-planar diagrams and there is no this oscillator factor it vanishes and this result is in, uh, co corresponds to the, 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 the statement that, that Ockel made in his papers in the beginning of 2000 because he, he was saying that if you have a non-commutative field theory and you have non-commutative or braided statistics then that's equivalent to the commutative field theory. He had this diagram with arrows and one of the arrows was that was this non-commutative field theory with non-commutative statistics ends up in the commutative theory. Of course, this is a result only for two point function, one loop. So we have to check consistently if we stay with local statement for higher loops, different diagrams and so on. And, but this is somehow, it's, uh, it's nice. It really corresponds to this and also it corresponds to discussion, like I said in the beginning with papers of Balachandra and the others, the people from Korea and also Gaetano and Julius uh, had similar, similar ideas in their paper from 2007. So this is a nice result. The thing that is not so nice is the electrodynamics. So I'm, I skip all the details about the L infinity and the formations and so on. I just showed the braided action, which looks like this. This is the vertex between photon and, uh, and electron, if you want. Uh, this F nu nu is completely abelian. So because uh, like, I said, like I said, the braided uh, gauge transformation, they stay in the Lie algebra. In the case of U1, they will stay abelian. That means that in our braided electrodynamics, uh, we don't really, photon does not interact with itself. So there is no, no interaction, photon, there are no photon, photon interaction, three or four, whatever. And also ghost, oh, sorry, once again, ghost completely decoupled because it remains an abelian theory. So ghosts do not interact with the gauge field. In this respect, we are, we, gauge sector is completely classical. The interaction is here with the uh, fermions and it has now this term with the R matrix. So it's sort of, instead of having an exponential factor, we have a cosine here because it's sort of totally symmetric. We calculated using this homological perturbation theory, the two point, photon two point, point function at one loop. And we ended up with this result. So this is still, it's not full because there are phases of gamma matrices and so on. This can be written now further on in terms of Bessel functions and check the divergences exact, exactly. But the point is that we end up with this oscillator factor here. It's not an exponential, it's cosine here, but still it's there. And if you take a limit of theta going to zero or the external moment of P goes to zero, this is a classical result. So we end up again with the UVIR mixing. Uh, the origin of this thing is different now because there is a fermion bubble, which normally in this star gauge theory, okay, done. 
Stargate theories that not, does not give contribution at all in the ordinary star electrodynamics, photon interacts with itself. Uh, so there is a diagram with a photon propagating here in this loop, and there is a photon like a tadpole, and there is a contribution from the ghost as well, because not in there they don't decouple. But fermion bubble does not give a non-commutative deformation. Here we only have a contribution of the fermion bubble and it gives a non-commutative deformation and it seems that it gives the sort of UV IR mixing. And that's confusing. We did not expect that and we would like to understand this better somehow to check what happens at higher loops to maybe recheck our calculations. So let's say that this result is still pre preliminary just because we are not happy with this. We hope it could, it could get better. So finally, uh, just brief, briefly to summarize. So we uh, we can construct uh, braided non-commutative field theories using the Drin twist formalism, L infinity algebras, and we know how to quantize them using this algebraic tools of the BV formalism and the homological perturbation theory. What we would like to, that there are some nice features like we don't need the universal enveloping algebra for the gauge theories, we can say in the Lie algebra. And it seems that uh, UVRI mixing is not present in the scalar field theories. If a gauge symmetry is a problem, in my opinion, it would be interesting to see uh, interacting field theories without gauge symmetries like Yukawa, for example. We could try looking at this and see if there we get mixing, uh, and it's, if it's really related with the gauge symmetry or it's related with just having uh, more than one field. I mean, let's see what happens there. In any case, our future work is uh, to understand better the properties both of classical braided field theories and of, of quantum braided field theories and uh, try to give some more answers in respect to the quantization in general of the non commutative field theory. Sorry if I went over time. But that's six questions. Do these are these algebras? Star algebras, do they have a representation on a Hilbert space? The second question is, are they causal? Um, I think it's, we avoid completely the issues of the Hilbert space here. We don't discuss these algebras are, uh, I don't know how to put it, but we never see Hilbert space here because of this algebraic homological perturbation theory and using the DV formalism. We avoid all the issues of, uh, Hilbert space, creation and equation operators, who is uh, what, and we avoid the path integral as well. It's all in the BV formalism. How does it take expectation values? I mean, what the mechanism requires a Hilbert space? I don't care about perturbation theory or creation. Uh, but it, uh, you do because it gives you the result. It gives you the correlation functions. You Basically, what you want to calculate in the end, you want to calculate your correlation functions and you want to calculate some scattering amplitudes for your process. No, it, it's enough to, to do the homological perturbation theory. You just, it, it's a BV, BV formalism approach. It's fully algebraic. It's known in since the seventies or eighties, more or less. And it's now revived using this L infinity approach. But you need a positive linear function. Normally it's the one on the identity of algebra. But once you have that, you have a GNS construction. So what is it? I, 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 I could say that I don't know what it is because we don't use it. Uh, Brian and Christian might help okay. me. The second question is, gauge invariance in the UN case mm -hmm. was proved by Weinberg to come from the lack of an interferon between the stability group or the C group of the photon of massless particles and a covariance representation in a proved long ago in book. For example, so that's classical uh, result. So yes. now there is a formulation where the representation is directly on a Hilbert space quite rigorously, but they are fields localized on cones. So mm -hmm. they are not local fields in the usual way, but they are fields localized on cones. And the algebraic order field theories have a formulation. I think mm -hmm. I'm not sure that for the U1 case, there is no problem in introducing star products because the field is defined. So one can do it's algebraic order field theory, so you can share it and take any product. Okay. I think that there is no such problem as gauge invariance there because there is no gauge invariance. It's gone. Everything is on a Hilbert space. Uh, so there uh, is no, no uh, crime space, no nothing. 
no, okay, it's not a problem of maybe not the gauge relative, it's a different theory that we get in this way with the L infinity approach and the one that, that comes out if you do the star commutators in the usual way. It's just if you get an interact of uh, three or four photon interaction or you don't, depends on somehow. It's a, these are two different models, uh, also with two different symmetries essentially, because the, the, the star symmetry has the usual Leibniz rule, it's different. And our braided gauge symmetry has a braided Leibniz rule. So these are these are just two different models, if you want. Maybe. Two different ways of defining, deforming the one. Jens Bund and uh, Garcia Bundia mm -hmm. have been writing papers where they have developed the uh, perturbation theory using this these localized run codes mm -hmm. for QED. Okay? Mm -hmm. And they get the usual series, but they come out with better convergence because the certain dimension of a certain field decreases. Okay? So mm -hmm. they, they, uh, convergence is better and they can do renormalization and it gives you the standard results like g minus two whatever okay? so i'm not clear why you need this combination at all uh, because we in this braided setting we don't know how to define the measure for the path integral because fields have braided statistics now how do i multiply to get so the you measure? don't use path integral That's no 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 not at all so the bb formalism somehow covers everything you don't need a path integral you don't need the hilbert space it uh, probably it hides something inside but it's for, for the moment it's convenient uh, I, among other references, I also forgot that to tell that Fedele and Patricia also looked and Paolo looked at this UVRI mixing things, or at least the the twisting of the Hilbert space. So this is also sorry for forgetting the reference. Yes. So for the uh, I think so. That, 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 that's, the, that's the expectation. We are curious to see if we fit really, because that's the statement of Focal, really, the full statement saying that non commutative uh, field theory plus non commutative statistics, which we have now, is this braided setting because of the braided weak, braided weak theorem encodes the braided statistics. So, somehow, if it does not happen, then it would be strange, and then we, let's see how we can understand it. Uh, if I, uh, okay, okay, that's a statement concerning scattering amplitude, and we haven't looked at the scattering amplitude so far. We only looked at the correlation function. So correlation functions are so far the same. Scattering amplitude we have to check. It might happen that this is uh, since the statement uh, for the concerning correlation function is the, corresponds to the Ockel statement, then probably the Scattering, well, scattering amplitudes, one should expect that it corresponds, but we haven't looked at the amplitudes because for the amplitudes, we have to change the projection because for correlation function, we project just to the usual vacuum and nothing. So projection is trivial. For scattering amplitude, we have we would really have to project to the physical state and then calculate it differently. Uh, It's the, so the, the actually the, the fit in the formula. The, the formula has LSS. Uh, in the correlation, we don't see it in the correlation function. It's completely that this uh, two point one loop is really the same as the classical one. Because somehow the interact the, the phases from the interaction action kill the phases from the braided VV, VV theorem and it just reduces to the commutative one. So far, I mean that's also something to investigate further. Move on to the next speaker. Um, I'm sure Maria will be I'm happy. Here. <laughs> yeah, discuss with you yeah, during the coffee break or whenever. Okay. Um, 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I would like to uh, first to uh, thank organizers for this possibility. It's very nice. This is my second time uh, on Corfu. Like it the same as the first time. I mean, so. So anyway. Uh, let us start. So today I will talk about some little exercise uh, which we decided to do, which actually took like five papers to solve that exercise. I mean, so, uh, <clears throat> but in any case, so mostly I'll be talking about this part, uh, essentially because I, uh, I don't know much about the, this part, and, and actually there's no universal consensus about this part. I mean. Uh, so more or less, I mean, uh, the main the main part will be like motivation. Why we uh, care about this exercise? Because being an exercise, I mean, uh, the solution is uh, technical, technical in very primitive way. Just put really some commutators, integrals, and all this stuff. So, and this is, uh, as I said, in, uh, several papers uh, in collaboration with different people, mostly with Al Stern. Fidelio also participated uh, uh, in one part of this of this project, and a couple of our students. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, just very quick reminder: what what are, what are those spaces? I mean, so it's really just kind of a table, schematical table uh, about the maximum symmetric spaces. Typically, you think of them like just being embedded in some uh, d plus one dimensional space, and depending on essentially uh, on the radius you classify them Ra radius and signature whether the signature uh, has minuses does not have minuses and all the stuff and, and this is some center stuff uh, the topology so but what is curious uh, about two dimensions that there is only two groups in two dimensions uh, for three or four cases is essentially the same Right, I mean, so by three cases, I mean the following. The, the sitter space, anti the sitter space, and Euclidean uh, anti the sitter space. <clears throat> so which means that uh, actually something, something uh, funny should happen in two-dimensional case. I mean, so, and that funny really happens. Uh, so here, just some standard, uh, uh, Standard parameterizations of two-dimensional space. This is the the, the Euclidean, uh, the, the Minkowski two-dimensional space. So uh, here, pretty much the same thing happens as in any dimension. Uh, you have some uh, close uh, time-like uh, groups, uh, contours, and you have to decompositify. So you, you have to go to universal covering. But I mean, this case. Uh, for the purpose of idea safety correspondence, I mean, I'm not selling idea safety correspondence. So we just uh, really were curious how far you can push uh, this uh, this correspondence. And then, uh, so for for the case of idea safety correspondence, apparently what people need they need uh, the Euclidean version uh, of ideas. Uh, so which I will describe later. So uh, first, so just some standard argument which this audience, of course, I mean, uh, knows very well. Why would you like to falsify everything? I mean, so I mean, so it's, it does not uh, seem like uh, like whatever you see commutative. Like let's make it non-commutative. But the point is that because I mean, uh, especially in this particular case, ideas CFT supposed to take care of quantum gravity and all the stuff. And uh, then you, you involve the standard uh, argument. For example, I don't know why I started with Friedenhagen. It's Doppler or Friedenhagen Roberts. Uh, which kind of actually model independent, right? I mean, so essentially, if you try to make some operational meaning of a point, try to measure it, I mean, that's it. I mean, so 
at some at some regime typically like Planck uh, scale if you think of quantum gravity uh, kicking in at Planck scale uh, you would start losing control over points so it, sh it should be some kind of modification of a geometry <clears throat> so uh, then of course I mean there are some ar other arguments coming from uh, some models attempting to describe quantum gravity <clears throat> but also another ingredient uh, that typically typically if you have some isometries the first step you would uh, like to do you would like to quantize it uh, to make it non-commutative in such a way as to preserve isom isometries as much as possible better in some undeformed way but i mean if needed i mean so okay, in, in the deformed way for ADS CFT it's actually quite important because if you remember the the, the first paper by Maldacena, actually it was based purely on, on on the correspondence between isometries on the gravity side and symmetries on the uh, CFT side. I mean, so it just mentioned symmetries essentially, I and mean, not much of the calculation. I mean, the calculation was done actually in several uh, months later by Witten, Polikov, Libanov. I mean, who told us how to actually calculate? I mean, so the our favorite fuzzy sphere is actually the example of how you uh, uh, quantize the space uh, retaining the same iso isometries. <clears throat> so, I mean, here is the argument of uh, Doppler, Krefer, and Hagen, and Roberts, which everybody knows. I mean, so it's a, for the flat uh, uh, sp space time for Minkowski, of course, I mean, but essentially uh, that's what I said. So, if you try to measure a point, I mean, you fail at some scale. And then uh, you argue that there uh, should be this kind of, uh, and so the, the argument of course, quasi classical meaning that you don't have quantum gravity, but I mean, uh, you can still push it uh, far enough to argue that that should be the uncertainty relations. And then they just kind of like knowing the answer, of course, I mean, you kind of guess uh, how it should look like and verify that those uncertainties. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, as I said, uh, I will be caring uh, about the fuzzy Euclidean uh, ADS. And many people uh, deal, uh, or studied this uh, non commutative ADS. I think mostly Minkowski, for example, Harold, here, and many other, other people. Uh, so Harold would su surprised that he studied this. <laughs> so, anyway, so. Uh, the point is the point. So, so that, that's 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 the relation which uh, defines ADS, as I told you. I mean, so what is about Euclidean? Euclidean it means that, that this metric has less minuses. I mean, uh, but I mean, this one is still minus uh, L squared, so cosmological constant is still ne negative. So uh, isometries form this algebra. Uh, the, the killings form this algebra, and the point is that there is natural Poisson structure compatible with with isometry so that that is always a nice thing which, because i mean there's the direct route uh, to quantization and this person structure of course i mean uh, in the usual way allows you to realize uh healings as just some uh, hamiltonian vector fields essentially uh here two sets so i'm putting this in details because i mean that's more or less will be uh, our route to, to quantization essentially more or less as much as possible copy paste in the commutative uh, steps <clears throat> uh, two standard sets uh, of the coordinates uh, and what is important i mean this bottom line uh, line here uh, with the Poisson structure so you you can see that <laughs> these coordinates are very nice because i mean i mean everybody knows how to quantize the, those I mean, right i mean and uh, actually the, the range is really from minus infinity to infinity this is really uh, plain <laughs> and these ones uh, look kind of weird but i mean uh, as we can see still uh, they have very natural quantization actually, without any quantum corrections i mean that you really can quantize that in the uh, so by quantization i mean the, the following that uh, of course, as usual, that we can find the representation of that uh, that algebra. I mean, so, so that will, will be the main question. I mean, uh, uh, so what is important for ADS now? If you look, if you look at those killings written in, in, in terms of T and Z coordinates, 
So the, the, the conformal boundary, the conformal boundary is located at, at uh, z plus zero. Okay. So the, the z is kind of like inverse radius of radius. So uh, it's located at z plus zero. And if you look at those killings and send formally z to zero, then of course you end up this kind of real uh, weak algebra, which is conformal, uh, conformal symmetry uh, of a circle, right? And so here. Uh, so that is kind of like the argument. Why, why would you expect something conformal on the boundary? And so you just look uh, there and you see, okay, so it's, it's there. So that, that's why actually ZT coordinates are much more convenient uh, from this point of view than XY coordinates, because for XY coordinates, the, the conformal boundary is actually at infinity. So typically, I mean, you don't like infinity in the sense that it's much difficult. Uh, uh to analyze so you want to bring it to some finite position and, and then you can look at it and of course i mean the question is about the boundary conditions how things behave <clears throat> so here is the quantization essentially as i said i mean for all three, three cases the group is the same uh so essentially the question is about do do i have enough of representations to incorporate uh, those three cases. I mean, so, and of course, I mean, you're looking for the unitary representations because you could kind of like want your space to be real. <clears throat> and the point is that it happens that you have just enough representations uh, to incorporate uh, Euclidean, uh, the sitter, uh, anti the sitter, uh, and actually like highly quantum uh, regime. So, I mean, this is some technical details, I mean, uh, some standard stuff. The main point is that the Casimir, I'm to the right, okay. Uh, so, I mean, the, the Casimir control uh, is, is usually, I mean, it controls actually, the cosmological constant. So essentially, uh, the classical limit would be recovered when k is sent to infinity. So the question, can you send k, k to infinity? Uh, and the answer is that for some series, you, you can. <clears throat> so the point is the following. I will not explain, I mean, so of course, I mean, this is some, some known stuff. I mean, so the point is that for one of the series, the Casimir is such that it's exactly L squared is negative, so that corresponds to Minkowski ADS. Then there is highly quantum uh, series, uh, which looks like Minkowski. But because, I mean, K is actually, you cannot send it to infinity. It's, I mean, by, by, the, uh, by the representation theory, it's confined within this uh, regime. Uh, so we interpreted that as a like, highly quantum uh, ADS without any classical uh, counterpart. But for us, for this talk at least, uh, these two series are uh, very nice. I mean, so I mean, you should not confuse them. I mean, so this is not DS, uh, so L squared is positive like for, for DS, but the point is, I, I told you, it's the same, <clears throat> the same group, so essentially going from Euclidean ADS to, uh, to from, from the Minkowski ADS to Euclidean ADS, you have to like uh, multiply the whole thing by minus one because like, I mean, you have in Minkowski two minuses one plus and negative cosmological constant. But if you multiply everything by uh, minus one, then you have two pluses, one minus and positive cosmological constant. And you have just reshuffle how you call your variables in essentially way. Like. <clears throat> and discrete series has exactly two families, which is very nice because I mean, you can see in uh, Euclidean ADS, it's actually made of two hyperboloids. I mean, essentially, it's like uh, Minkowski is hy uh, one hyperboloid when you rotate about the vertical X, and this one, uh, two hyperboloids when you uh, rotate about the, the, the symmetry X, I mean, let's say. And so you have two hyperboloids and like that. You know. So the point is that each series you can show corresponds to either that one or that hyperboloid. So you have in just enough representations to have correct uh, commutative limits, which is kind of nice uh, and under control and to the 
satisfaction uh, of bulk, we do have representations, not on the Hilbert space, but I mean still representations. So anyway, so here are some some uh, uh, explicit formulas. I mean, I, I mean, uh, of course you don't have to follow, but I mean they show that you do have representation. I mean, on the Hilbert space, not not on the Hilbert space, meaning that uh, you can rep represent those, uh, your embedding coordinates uh, from three-dimensional space uh, as real uh, differential operators uh, with some basis made of uh, uh, Laguerre. Uh, and all this stuff, and so meaning uh, everything under, uh, under control completely. Uh, and these are, as I said, this is uh, the quantum analog uh, of the radius of ideas. Okay, so it's well defined, uh, and you can show that this is just nothing but difference of some uh, uh, embedding coordinates. But as I said, I mean, uh, you would like. Uh, to, uh, now to, to realize, so if you have representation, now it's the question like, why do you care about like star products and all this stuff? I mean, uh, so depending on the question, uh, whether you need it or not, I mean, so for my purpose, I will need kind of a star product because eventually I would like to calculate some correlators. And at the moment, I don't know how to do it purely uh, algebraically. So I, I will really need some integrals over symbols and all this stuff. I mean. Uh, and in the moment it will be clear. But the point is that uh, passing to those uh, X and Y global coordinates, uh, of course, I mean, you immediately end up with more kind of uh, star product. So quantization is trivial, but then you can show that you can actually go uh, to those ZT coordinates. So, so T, T, think of T as a time running or, or uh, along the conformal boundary, it's one dimensional, so it's it's just, just quantum mechanics. <clears throat> so Z, as I said, measures the distance from the boundary. Uh, in, it goes into the bulk. Uh, so you can show that actually uh, you can uh, go from this star product in terms of X and Y, the star products in terms of, of ZT, actually in the correct way, uh, meaning that not cheating, just like okay, let's do change of variables and all stuff. No, I mean so. You, you can show that uh, everything is fine, uh, self adjoint uh, and all this stuff, meaning that it's realized by some operators. <clears throat> so, okay. So that, that was uh, non-commutative ideas. So uh, that's what's about geometry. Now let's go about this idea of CFT. So very brief uh, dictionary, uh, the classical one, uh, once again. So we just believe, for example, that it's supposed to work. So how it's supposed to work, the simplest case uh, of the scalar field, of course, is, is like that. I mean, so you, you put, uh, you think of, a, of, of, of fields, of a, it is the ground, there's some perturbations, in it, essentially. So then uh, you put your favorite action uh, uh, on the ADS background, you even put some interaction here, uh, and then try to solve the equation of motion. Uh, Subject to some boundary condition, essentially. Because, uh, so, essentially, the condition is that asymptotically, when z goes to infinity, which corresponds to r goes to zero, so this is center of your ideas, everything is regular. <clears throat> so, then you solve it, uh, and you find uh, the solution with the correct behavior uh, has this form uh, near the boundary where phi zero is exactly kind of your like uh, boundary uh, boundary condition so you cannot set set it uh, uh, boundary condition just uh, z goes to zero you have to factor out this guy because as you can see it goes to, to zero so it's really this factor times your boundary condition <clears throat> uh, where those deltas just some usual stuff essentially the conformal dimension of your scalar field and And then, then you do the following. Then you really try to find the solution in the bulk using all this uh, bulk to bulk, uh, boundary to bulk propagators and all the stuff. Plug it back into the class, uh, into the action, uh, and now you have. Uh, so this is the solution, of course, in the usual uh, way. 
So plugging back into the action, of course, as usual, the part which corresponds to the equation of motion identically killed, what will survive the boundary terms as usual. Uh, I mean, in the case of interaction, not only boundary terms. I mean. So, but the point is that now it will be uh, the functional of the boundary value of the field. Okay. So, and then the, the dictionary is like that. Okay. So this functional from the point of view of the boundary is a generated, uh, generated functional for the correlators where the boundary fields, they really the sources for whatever your uh, observables on the boundary. So, which means that unspecified observables, I mean, so I mean, to specify them, you really have to name uh, your dual part, I mean. So that's what I'm saying, that I'm not giving names. I mean, uh, and, and strictly speaking, as I said, nobody can uh, give the precise name, uh, what is CFT1 that. I mean, there are candidates, but I mean, any other. <clears throat> so, in the usual way, so if you treat that as a generative functional, so for example, two point correlator, just vary with, uh, with respect to phi zero, because I mean, inter interaction will not conceive it. I mean. uh, three point, okay, so that's where interaction comes in and kicks in. And that's the standard conformal behavior, to those denominators, right? I mean, so it's the correct conformal dimensions and all this stuff. So, the idea uh, is to mimic this. Uh, so why now the, the main point, uh, it's not just like, I mean, we want to, okay, so let's do it non-commutative. The point is that uh, this idea of CFT correspondence, uh, correspondence is supposed uh, to be like an ex exact one, not just between the classical gravity, uh, uh, and some conformal field theory, so like a uh, weak, strong, no, but the, the exact one. Uh, so I mean, uh, between quantum gravity and whatever is on the boundary. So because it was celebrated actually as like the first formulation of quantum gravity in ideas five. So, but then everybody believes, I mean, it is uh, in this audience, the majority believes that uh, non commutativity, you can think of non commutativity is kind of like quasi classical regime of quantum gravity, meaning that it captures a little bit of quantum gravity. Like if you look at the Fredenhagen uh, uh, Doppler K. Roberts ar argument, so it really comes from some kind of unspecified quantum gravity. And plus, it comes not in the perturbative way. I mean, so you cannot construct uh, 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 non commutativity, strictly speaking, uh, in, in the completely uh, perturbative way. Uh, I mean, you can, if you like, do more, but uh, you will see what I mean. Uh, so it should capture some, some non perturbative effects of, of quantum gravity in one way or another. Uh, and plus, we quantize the space in such a way that isometry is preserved. So if I can treat the non commutative idea space, uh, somehow is this asymptotically ADS, the commutative one, then ADS CFT correspondence tells, tells me that uh, it should still work. Because I mean, I have kind of like quantum gravity in ADS, I have the commutative uh, boundary. So we all set uh, to start applying dictionary. So what is the problem for me with this uh, uh, construction? Uh, the point is that non commutativity naturally introduces a scale which does not live very well uh, with conformal symmetry. Uh, so, how, how that uh, thing, how can that happen? I mean, that you still have conformal, uh, uh, conformal theory on the boundary. So, that was the main motivation to check is, uh, is it true that uh, ADS CFT still works even in the presence of non commutativity or? The conformal, uh, the, 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 the boundary theory also gets deformed. Then, I mean, it's not that interesting. Okay, so I deformed something in the bulk. I deformed, uh, I, I got some, def some deformation on the boundary. But then it clearly it would go against kind of idea CFT because I mean, uh, I don't have uh, conformal theory on the boundary, though I do have uh, like asymptotically a, a uh, ADS. So, the first step is to see that we have asymptotic ideas. So that is actually here. 
I mean, so this is the, the action. Uh, it's not a problem. So I showed you how to quantize. So just take the usual, uh, the usual action and, and <laughs> write everything in terms of the commutator and the trace or the, your favorite star product, uh, depending on the coordinates which you use. But the point is that you can calculate explicitly killings. So I'm not specifying, this is some, some differential operator with infinite number derivatives in time, which starts as a, as a deformation of time derivative. Uh, so the same things here. But the point is when you send Z to zero, it really degenerates to the usual commutative killings on the boundary. So asymptotically close to the boundary, the algebra of killings really starts looking more and more uh, as the commutative one. That could be seen if uh, also if you write the star product in terms of ZT coordinates, then you see that in terms of these coordinates, the effective star is not actually alpha, whatever is alpha, the, 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 so you, you put alpha for, uh, for, the control, uh, for the purpose to control the non-commutivity, but it's actually alpha times Z squared. So effective non-commutativity dies when you approach, uh, approach the boundary. Uh, so that was the, uh, uh, the argument that actually non-commutative ADS asymptotically uh, behaves more and more as the commutative ADS. So whatever non-commutative, whatever quantum gravity you have, it's in the bulk. Near the boundary, it, it looks really like the commutative one. So that's why you supposed to have some conformal theory. Uh, so th this is more... Uh, uh, more concrete uh, calculation, uh, meaning that this is the equation of motion. So, of course, you start with the free case. Uh, and when when we started, so that's why it took four papers. And, yeah. Say it more loud, please. Uh -huh. So my point is that actually we go in the, uh, one direction from the bulk, but the point is that if ADS CFT is true, then uh, the theory on the boundary, I mean the full theory, quantum field theory, should correspond to the full quantum gravity in the bulk. So that, that's, uh, that's my point. If this is strong form of ADS CFT, I mean, like, so uh, in our case, we, we go in the, the opposite direction, like, in the bulk, we have some kind of effects, some, some traces of quantum gravity, you, and we want to see how the correlators behave on the boundary. Do they still behave conformally or not? So that's, I don't know. If. <clears throat> so in any case, uh, the point is that the first hint how the the main, the main selling point, point of this talk that we managed to find the exact solutions. I mean, exactly non-commutative parameter uh, to the equation of motion, at, at least for the three case. I mean. So the first hint how the solution should behave uh, came actually from these two uh, expressions. So if you factor out, so kappa is just uh, some uh, expression. So alpha is, as I said, is a deformation parameter, non-commutative parameter. So if you factor out one, one, one of kappas, then you will see that uh, these expressions, they look exactly as in the commutative case, the relation between embedding coordinates and local coordinates, uh, if, except that Z is rescaled by, by kappa. So factor one, one kappa, then you have kappa Z. Here it will, you, you have uh, exactly uh, one over kappa Z, one over kappa Z and all the stuff. So the, hint, the, the guess was probably the solution should behave uh, should have the same form as the classical one, but instead of Z, you should just uh, rescale kappa. Actually, that hint came not from this expression, but from the uh, asymptotic form of the, uh, of the equation of motion. Approaching to the boundary, equation of motion uh, starts looking more and more like uh, Klein-Gordon on ADS with Z rescaled. So, but that guess was made only in the third paper. So the first two papers, we tried to do that perturbatively in non-commutative parameter. And we, we showed that up to the second order, 
uh, correlators behave uh, actually conformally. But that was very annoying because, I mean, it's very, very symmetric space. And not having exact solutions is kind of like really annoying because, I mean, uh, uh, it's like the, the best situation what you, uh, what you can have and you cannot find even the, the solutions for the, for the free case. I mean. <clears throat> so, but then we realized that actually uh, we can solve it, I mean. So essentially like kind of mimicking uh, the commutative uh, situation. Uh, so you can separate the variables in some symmetric way. So that, that's, that's the equation of motion written in, the, in, those, in terms of the coordinates R and T or Z and T, as I said, is, uh, R is inverse of Z. And all, everything is well defined, as I said, in the, in the operator of sense. sense. So this, is, this does not involve any star products. In so this purely operator equation. And separating variables, uh, you end up with this modified Legendre uh, equation or generalized Legendre equation for one operator variable. So which, of course, I mean, generates the, the commutative algebra. And then as usual, I mean, so then you just copy paste uh, uh, the most convenient set of all the solutions, right? So those associated Legendre, uh, uh, functions. I mean, of course, only two of them are independent. So, but uh, they have different uh, behavior, uh, asymptotic behavior. I mean, so, uh, to answer the question, which one of those two solutions we should take? Because I mean, as I said, I mean, this is really some operators defined uh, via some continuous calculus, for example. Uh, you you have to compare that uh, with the uh, classical limit which will tell you which solution has the correct classical limit, which, which one you should uh, pick up. Actually, that turned out not that trivial, uh, trivial task uh, technically, because I mean, of course, I mean, I can set uh, alpha zero here, and then I will just get Bessel, uh, actually modified Bessel. Uh, so, and then you recover the regular, uh, at the origin of ADS solution, this McDonald's and all this stuff. And so, uh, McDonald function, uh, but you would you would like to get this function as a limit from one of those, and as you can see, uh, non-commutativity enters actually not only in the argument, but it enters actually also uh, uh, in the index uh, of the function. So you have to take some tricky uh, limit when both argument and the uh, uh, the parameter go goes to uh, to zero. So, I mean, anyway, so this is some te technical fun, uh, which you can actually uh, solve, but as a bonus for that, you fix the correct uh, normalization. Correct in the sense uh, that, I mean, I, I, I still could have some constant here, but that constant will be alpha independent, not, de not dependent on the commutative parameter. So, uh, and then with this, a correct normalization you establish that okay so the behavior is fine so now now of course when you take the limit so that's the first time when you uh, should resort uh, to symbols instead of operators because i mean you don't take the limits uh, of the operator or at least you have to uh, you think in the sense of the spectrum that you go for like find the spectrum <clears throat> so and then so that was that was, that settled so essentially, that's the first result. So this is the exact solution of the for the scalar field on non-commutative Euclidean, Euclidean ADS. Then we wanted to go back. I mean, so so that result has not been published uh, yet. I mean, so uh, but this one was. I mean, not this one. Uh, which one? This one. So uh, for the massless scalar field. We found the exact solution hard way, as, as I said. I mean, so we guessed it, and then we developed like like pages and pages some algebraic calculations just to to verify that okay, so it's a solution. I mean, so if you comp uh, if you look at this solution, so this solution looks like really the, the usual solution of of Klein Gordon, and you have sum of two arbitrary functions uh, of left right movers essentially. Or holomorphic anti holomorphic that is Euclidean. But as I said, I mean, z coordinates should be modified by that factor, uh, kappa. This does not look anything like that. I mean, so 
I leave it as a homework to show that this is actually the same thing. And then, so meaning that the answer we will put online soon. And so the, the, the homework. But the, the point is, it's just uh, why homework? Because I mean, it's really some some textbook uh, algebra. If you know the commutators, how to commute and all this stuff. And, but I mean, kind of uh, annoying. So then you take that exact solution and play the same game uh, which you played in the, in the commutative case. You have, the, you have the action now, you have exact solution, plug it back and see what happens. So it happens essentially the same thing, only the boundary term survives. <clears throat> For that you need some proper properties of the star product that as I told you, you remember that the non-commutativity non dies away when Z goes to zero as Z squared. <clears throat> So uh, that you need to guarantee that really just boundary uh, term survives. Uh, and actually the only effect of non-commutivity star product uh, of, of course goes away says dot, dot product, but non-commutivity survives in the, in the fields. Fields receive some quantum corrections. And because you have exact solutions, uh, so the only trick, I mean, uh, of course, I mean, because I mean the boundary is at Z plus zero, uh, so that's uh, take. Uh, you should take care how you, you do that. I mean, so typically you put your boundary at some epsilon. You specify your boundary condition as epsilon, and only after that you send epsilon to zero. Because two limits do not commute. You don't. You, you cannot just like uh, set uh, uh, boundary uh, conditions exactly at plus zero. But evaluate integral at epsilon and then send to zero. Actually, uh, you will obtain slightly different results. I mean, very similar, but slightly different. I mean. <clears throat> so, but the point is that you, you, you can play that game. And that's exactly the, what I said. I mean, so you can calculate. So, this is non commutative on shell action. And this is commutative on shell action. And you see that the, the main part, the part which is quadratic in, 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 the, in the fields, in the boundary fields, is exactly the same. The, the whole effect of non-commutivity is in some prefactor, exact in alpha. So which means that if you take the ratio of commutative and non-commutative uh, two-point correlators, uh, you will have just a number, I mean, alpha dependent number, but if you send alpha to, to, to zero, of course it starts with one and some quantum corrections, which surprisingly coincide with the corrections, which uh, I told you that we started this game perturbatively. Uh, so that was very surprising because perturbative calculation is really, really messy. When we did it, I was sure that we, we made a mistake, but I was also sure that nobody is going to verify it. I mean, so we just said, okay, so it's fine. <clears throat> uh, uh -huh. So, but the, so, as I said, surprisingly, uh, it's actually the same. Uh, it's slightly different, but I mean, like we, we explain why, why it's different because we use different uh, connection essentially. But uh, otherwise the calculation is absolutely perfect. <clears throat> uh, so at least for the massless case, we can say that actually the whole effect of non-commutivity, uh, bulk non-commutivity is kind of like uh, rescaling of the fields, the fields will be uh, renormalized. So, I mean, renormalized in the classical sense. So, there's no uh, like quantum calculation. So, this is really like uh, correspondence between classical uh, field theory on non commutative uh, space and some, some, uh, some quantum theory, quantum uh, on the boundary, because quantum, because we, we do calculate the related I mean, from there. <clears throat> Uh, and the be behavior, uh, so nothing receives, uh, nothing conformal receives any corrections, no conformal symmetry itself. And even the conformal dimensions, they remain exactly the same. I mean, so which is, as I said, uh, kind of surprising because I mean, we, we thought that we will get corrections. For the interacting case, we can say much less. So that's, uh, uh, for the interacting case, we still stand at the level of this paper. Uh, we made some arguments, so the, the, the technical te technicality, technical complications even much greater than uh, in the uh, free case. But I mean, we 
could actually argue that non-commutative three-point function uh, is also conformal. So we could not fix the factor. I mean, conformal up to the, the, the uh, first non-trivial order. We could not uh, fix this, this factor, but using, uh, it's essentially the same arguments, right? right? How you, you fix the form uh, of the correlators in the usual conformal, just using the symmetry, you, you fix the form uh, uh, of the correlator uh, up to this third, uh, three, uh, three point correlation. So, so here's the, oh, the same thing. And so you can write it and then you just start applying one uh, uh, to another, the symmetries, I mean, and you, uh, because I mean, uh, you do have uh, uh, symmetries. And we, we kind of showed that all the, those messy integrals, they respect those symmetries, so it must have this form. So to go further, uh, you need kind of like, I mean, further meaning that exact in the non-commutative non parameter, you need kind of like green function, uh, exact one. I mean. So that is something that we're hoping uh, to get just for fun. So conclusions would be the following. So actually, the first time I made talk about this topic exactly like two years ago, in, uh, just before the pandemic. I mean, so I left actually conclusions from that talk. Why? Because in that talk conclusions, I mean, uh, uh, I indicated what we would like to do. And so check marks, uh, I put that that's what we've done I mean, actually. Uh, so the point is that uh, what I wanted to deliver during this talk uh, is the following, that it seems that if you think of non-commutivity as kind of like uh, traces of quantum gravity, that it seems that it, at least in this simple case, uh, uh, there is kind of possibility to confirm that it's still working. So meaning that though you have non-commutivity scale in the bulk and all the stuff, uh, at the boundary, you do have uh, something conformal. What is that SYK? So the most popular candidate is SYK. <clears throat> so, so that's that's the second question. I mean, so I mean the the, the big one. I mean, so what is uh, uh, what is that dual theory? So why I'm talking about a truncation here? So I just said about this uh, SYK theory. So uh, it's a one-dimensional theory of fermions. Uh, which does not have uh, an exact uh, conformal symmetry. Uh, but I mean, it has conformal symmetry in, in some limit. So, uh, which corresponds to the fact that, I mean, it's dual not to exact ADS, but only in some limit. Uh, is so from string point of for string people, this is very natural thing. I mean, so uh, uh, I don't know how much is natural, but the point is that from, from our point of view, so if you look at the parameters, uh, what we have in the theory, uh, we do have a way how to make this uh, ADS approximate exactly along the lines of <clears throat> uh, uh, of this SYK. I mean, so you should consider like on the SYK, you should consider the finite number of those fermions, Marana fermions. So here it would correspond to some consistent uh, truncation uh, of the infinite representation. And the consistency would be the following. The truncating, of course, immediately uh, spoil the symmetry, would spoil the symmetry. I mean, I, I, uh, because I mean, uh, this, the isometry SU11 is not compact. So, I mean, you can, I, I cannot have the finite uh, representations, uh, unity representations. Uh, so, meaning that if I truncate it, uh, necessarily I break, uh, 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 deform the symmetry, the isometry. So, but that, that would, would exactly agree with what people say on the uh, CFT side, that for finite number of Majorana fermions, you don't have actually conformal symmetry and all this stuff. I mean, so, but anyway, so that is, so today I talk about the solution to this problem, at least partial for the free case and all this stuff. Uh, other types of fields, uh, uh, we, we show that actually the fermion field you can solve very simply, essentially just, by mapping the solution for the for the scalar field, I mean, so we found the exact map uh, for, for this two-dimensional case to the Fermi, uh, to the uh, fermionic case. Uh, in the paper by, uh, with Fidele, uh, we addressed kind of like a high-dimensional case, some non-compact CP spaces, C, CPPQ, uh, 
kind of projective spaces, but not compact ones. Uh, and there we showed uh, partially on the level of the killings, uh, killing vectors, that they do uh, respect the same thing, that they go uh, to, to the conformal ones at the boundary. So, I mean, that's more or less two new questions which I put for this particular talk. I mean, so uh, can we do uh, something about the interacting? Why interacting case uh, is interesting because it would uh, allow us uh, more or less to control that, uh, that factor. Of course, in, for two point function, uh, that pre, pre, pre factor, it's not that important. I can just reabsorb it into the definition of the field. But, uh, but in the three dimensional case, now if I rescale my fields in, uh, for, for two po uh, point relator, then for three point relator, I should see whether it's enough or I have some additional corrections. So, but for that, I need to, to go to interaction and then relation to some uh, uh, other stuff. So I think that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, I have two questions, but let me start with the first one. So uh, for, I know that four dimensional extreme black holes, if you take the near horizon limit, you get an ADS2 times S2 kind of structure. Mm -hmm. My question is, what more can you learn about the horizon if you take the near horizon limit, if you use your formalism? So the non commutative ADS2, is it something that can add to what we already know? So, first, I will start with disclaimer. I, I don't know much about things, but my, my, my point of view uh, is that, as I said, I mean, uh, the limit which you're talk, uh, talking about, this is really like on the, li uh, on the level of the geometry. So if you, if you look at the, the metric, you take the limit. So, so this is purely classi classical gravity. So supposedly, you might learn about some quantum gravity regime near horizon. So that's the, that, that's the point, because I mean, uh, up to now, still you don't have uh, the, the control, um, um, uh, really explicit control, what is the gravity on ADS, right? I mean, so I mean that you can take this point of view, the gravity on ADS is uh, uh, supersymmetric conformal N equals four, uh, uh, super young meals, I mean, so that, that's the point of view. So, that is my quantum gravity. But explicitly, like, what is quantum gravity? Uh, uh, I think uh, we don't have that control. So uh, non commutativity as I said, I mean, supposedly having some traces of whatever is quantum gravity. Of course, it might have uh, nothing to do with reality because, I mean, quantum gravity might actually break explicitly even on the uh, subquantum scale, uh, there is only the stuff. Okay, so the, the question, the second question maybe is a quick one. Uh, you, you mentioned that you have a deformed parameter, like for non commutativity. Uh -huh. And a naive question is how should I think about this deformation parameter from the theory side, so from the boundary point of view? You, you say that this kind of uh, non commutativity vanishes when you go to the boundary, uh -huh. but is there something that can mimic this behavior from the CFT point of view? So from my, uh, okay, so uh, the point is that uh, there is like uh, non, uh, constant non commutative parameter which enters the, the, uh, the quantization of the Poisson structure and the effective non commutativity exactly what you said, it dies away. So the, the, survival, uh, uh, the surviving part is in some renormalization of the uh, oral realization of the uh, correlators. So I would say that if this whole business is true, uh, that should come on the, uh, on, on the uh, side of the uh, uh, boundary field theory as some non-perturbative uh, effects. Uh, so the answer is, I don't know what is this alpha in the boundary uh, theory. So supposedly it should take care of some, so maybe the point is that if you manage ever to establish this uh, really correspondence, 
maybe boundary theory will fix the lambda, meaning that it should fix some kind of scale, quantum gravity scale. I mean, so maybe it will fix it. Sorry. Okay, so you mainly consider the, the, the free field theory. Yeah. And now in the, the free case on ADS is a purely group theoretical problem. Right. So in also in the fuzzy, both in the fuzzy case and in the commutative case, which means there is really a one-to-one -one quantization map which respects all the structure and you can make it as a metric and then it's unique. And then the free fuzzy theory is exactly the same thing as so, so yeah, the free fuzzy case is exactly the same as the as the classical one. So in fact, I, it should you can absorb probably all these normalization. I think it's clear that also the boundary is exactly the same. Now, as soon as you switch on the interaction, of course, that's no longer true. And then due to UVR mixing in the bulk, the the, the bulk theory is actually very non-local. So then presumably your boundary theory will also be some non-local conformal field theory. Mm -hmm. So that actually might, might even be interesting to work out. True, true. The free case is completely trivial in my opinion. True. Uh, the point is that that that's what what I said. Uh, <coughs> that uh, in some sense, I mean, you can treat interacting theory without having the solution uh, for the free theory. So uh, theoretically, it's true. I mean, there is a map, but to find that actually solution in the explicit form, uh, that that uh, so, but that was a necessary pre pre prerequisite to treat the interact, uh, interacting theory. As I said, interacting theory, we did treat perturbatively and the perturbation, uh, first non-trivial perturbation indicates that it still survives. But of course, that's the main interest. I mean, so that, that's for sure. Because uh, especially to check what is the effect uh, of this bulk non-commutivity, is it really just boils down to, to overall rescaling or it really produces something more, more non-trivial and all this stuff. I mean, so uh, that, we do, uh, that, that is more ambitious. That, Actually, more ambitious technically pro uh, project because I mean, ideologically, it's clear what must be done, but technically, uh, kind of a mess. Yeah, it will be non local. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I think. Okay, so we call the Bastian, which is the non commutative. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's it. And curve momentum is space. Okay. Okay. Is it loud enough or shall I? Okay. So let's go. Basically, what I'm going to talk about today is the relation between curve momentum spaces and some. Sorry? Okay, and some non commutative fun, uh, non commutative theories. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of examples. That's basically what I'm going to do. I'm go I will try to motivate some interest interesting questions, at least for me. For example, in the first part of the talk, I will be trying to to compute vacuum energies and trying to derive some, let's say, physical consequences from, from these curve momentum spaces. That part of the talk would be based on some work with Salvatore Miniemi. Um, then in the second part of the talk, I will try also to motivate the use of curve momentum spaces in order to discuss fermions in this kind of theories. And that will be based in some works with Javier Relancio. Then in the end, I'm just going to, to conclude the talk. So first of all, as a first brief, really brief 
introduction for those of you who, who haven't been working in non commutative theories. The basic fact is that we have we introduce a non vanishing commutators between coordinates. And then, of course, we will have some other commutators in the theory, but the basic one is this one. And usually, on the right hand side of that equation, we introduce some theta, which may or may not depend on the coordinate. And usually, one would expect that the scale of that contribution would be of order of the Planck length. If you want to, to trace back the original idea, well, we may discuss if it was a Snyder, if it, there was some contribution a lot of in the 30s by Schrodinger. But in any case, the idea behind these kind of theories was uh, the one that I'm just depicting there in, in that picture. If you want to go to, to the UV scale, then you will have some sort of Heisenberg uncertainty principle between the coordinates. So a space becomes passive, and therefore it could be a way to regularize divergences in quantum theory. Now let me talk from the phenomenological point of view. There are mainly two groups of theories that are used today trying to, to see if there is some, some kind of contribution of non commutative contribution. The first one is related to Lorentz invariance violation. So people try to see if Lorentz is really an invariance of the theory. They introduce some terms that are not covariant. Then they compare with experiments and, and they see whether there is a privilege observer in the universe or if there is not. The second type of theories that is also considered, let's say, in, in phenomenological studies is double special relativity in which people have um, a relativity principle, but usually it may be deformed. In that case, what people want to have is the, the Planck's length in the theory. And therefore, this, this kind of theories has two fundamental constants, one which is the speed of light and the other which is Planck's length. One type of this of the later is Snyder space or anti-Snyder space also, which you have seen in, in one of the talks um, on, on Thursday. Um, basically, what we have in this case is that the Lorentz generator with add the J satisfy the usual algebra. Then the P's and the K's, when we act with the Lorentz generators, they behave as vectors. And then you have um, a non commutativity between coordinates, which is given by the Lorentz generators. And you have there a parameter beta, which is again usually associated to some Planck swing. Uh, well, you will have some deformed commutation relation between X and P. And the commutation within the P's is just vanishing. The next question that you could ask is what, what kind of theory we can study or what kind of physical, physical measurements we could do in this theory. The proposal that we have made is trying to see the vacuum energy of this theory. So maybe you have seen this before. Basically, I'm talking about the casing effect. In the usual commutative case and classical case, well, one says, uh, let's have two plates in vacuum. And what happens? Well, nothing, nothing happens. They are just there, they will stay there. But if you consider the quantum processes, which I'm writing there, or I'm depicting there with a whole class of Feynman diagrams, then something happens. And this was the, the original idea by Casimir uh, in this paper from 1948. What he was trying to do is to compute the frequencies of the modes in such configuration. The idea is pretty simple. Um, he was trying to compare the sum of the energies in some configurations with one distance, with one distance L between the plates, 
And basically the formula that he derived was this one. So there is a force, a non-vanishing force, which is uh, given by the inverse of, of the length to the fourth in four dimensions and, and so on and so forth. What yeah. Um, uh, well, uh, because we have a minus here. Uh, in your talk, basically you have had a, a beta square here. Yeah. Basically, there's not 0 for 1, right? Is that the case? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 0, 3, 3. Yes, that's it. Yeah. Uh, oh, well, they, they are there in the J's. Um, well, yeah, the, basically, we'll be working in, in Euclidean. You will see it in, in a second. Okay. Um, so, what I was trying to, to point out is that this has been confirmed experimentally. So if you go and do the measurement, which was not so easy to do, uh, you can see the nice one over the length to the fourth behavior of these points. Um, the computation that we have done, uh, well, just to answer the question by, by Bala, uh, there we are considering time, surprising time, and the anti Snyder would be just the spatial part. So we won't consider a non commutativity in the time. And that's an important part. And that would also change the answer to your question because then we have just one time and then anti Snyder on the other. So we don't have two time components. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So basically, what we, we were doing it was considering. Uh, the special, the special, let's say, contribution to, to the wave equation, which is given by that Hamiltonian. So we have P squared, but P squared is now uh, an operator, which is given, for example, in some realization uh, in which P's are coordinate, the P's without hat are coordinate, we are choosing like that. And there also we have some uh, X hat, some potentials depending on X hat, with our coordinates, which are operators in this case. For example, you can take them in this realization as derivative acting on, on the P coordinate. And one, well, one not, not so easy point is that if you want to localize things in, in this kind of series, it's not that easy because it is non commutative. Therefore, we have introduced this to Hebe side functions. Side functions of the operators, not of the of coordinates. The, the x there are operators, the operators, let's say, associated with one direction in space. And at the end of the day, we have taken the Vigo into infinity limit. So that was the procedure. The procedure. We computed the, the frequencies, we have some of the frequencies, and we have obtained the force corresponding to this case. To this non commutative space. You can see the formulas, don't get lost in the formulas. I'm just going to discuss what, what the physical intuition is behind this. And the first one is that you have a contribution, an overall contribution, which is basically given by, by metric. And the metric is in this case uh, of the hyperbolic space. So, what I'm saying is that. In some sense, naturally, we have a curved momentum space, which is given by a hyperbolic space. The next comment that I, I would like to do is that we still have divergences. We do, uh, as in the usual case. Um, but in this case, it is not given by the sum over the modes. I mean, the modes you can see here, if you take the the p going to one over beta, which is the limit there, they are bounded. So the modes are not increasing. They are not divergent, but they are bounded. But the divergence, if you choose d big enough, is given by the geometry, by the geometry in curved momentum space. So that's, I would say, a really interesting physical consequence of, of this one. Still another comment. Um, we have checked that with a couple of realizations, the result is the same. Of course, that's not a mathematical proof, but 
that uh, let's say we are we are we are safe in in a physical sense. Um, and the last comment that I want to do is that basically what one is trying to do in this case is to obtain a certain function of the operator HV evaluated at minus one half. So this result is related to spectral to spectral functions. And if you want to have a closer look, I have this slide, and in this slide, I'm going, I'm doing an expansion. And if you go to compute the first term in the expansion, what you see is that apart from some overall factors, you have the volume of the hypervoid space. And then if, yeah. Sorry, in this slide, what is speed without the hat? They are the coordinates of momentum space. Sorry? They, yeah, 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 they are commutative. Okay, um, so if you go to the next order in this sort of expansion, what you get is still another term which is given by a volume, but in this case, it is a volume of a hypersurface, which is given um, by setting the normal coordinate of this momenta just to zero. So we still, we are getting some geometrical quantity, but in momentum space. And I, I couldn't avoid or resist to the temptation of writing this phrase or this or rephrasing this, this question that was that was raised in, in some talk during this week. Can we hear the shape of momentum space? Yeah. I want you to answer the question. Uh, uh, this case, made out. This parameter. Okay, well, uh, that's a nice question. Um, basically, I'm doing an expansion uh, which gives um, which is comfortable in, in order to do the computations. I mean, you have to do these integrals. So I'm expanding in, in some function which is related to, to sign to cinch of beta time, times kn and so on. So uh, there is no expansion like a proper time expansion or something like that at this point. Well, yeah, that, that's true. That's true. Um, neither do I. What I would say is that the expansion is just given by, by integrals that are more convergent than the, the previous one in, in this integral. That's the kind of expansion that I'm doing. So th there is no, in this expression, there, there is um, a priori no. Third term, uh, one upon edge or something. Like it seems so, yeah, but, but, but I, I do not have under control. It. Uh, what, what I have is just under control the, this integral. That was, if you try to, to do some, for example, an expansion in beta, then things become messy because um, you start having divergent integrals, which are Diversion and more diversion, and and that's the problem. So, what I was doing at that point is expanding in order to have always more convergent convergent integrals in, in that expansion. Okay. Okay, and then, well, if you want to, you can go um, and consider some constraints. People are doing this for various kinds of theories. I'm not going to get into the details of this plot, uh, but just know if you want to to do or to put some bounds on beta on the, on the beta parameter, then you will obtain bounds of the order of 
of 10, 10 to the 2, 10 to the 3 giga electron volts. So uh, this is a nice moment if you have more questions to, to ask them about this person. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, in principle, yeah. basically saying that if we compute we do the same computation translating let's say at this point if we yeah mm -hmm. okay yeah good point Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, well, it, it will be interesting to try to understand. Uh, so basically, what we are saying is, we, we put two plates at some point. Then, if we translate, we will get another answer. That's your point. Yeah. Yeah. differentiate between what happens in, in configuration space and what happens in momentum space. I mean, if you, if you trade or if you switch X with P, I would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, that's that's a lot. Um, so let's go to to the second part of the talk. In the second part of the talk, as I said, I will be talking about the relation with fermions. And let me first say that usually in this phenomenological approach, what people do is to consider some modify dispersion relation for particles. And if you want to do phenomenology, you just need to read the first term of this Casimir, which will give the, the mass shell. Uh, if you want to do some theoretical computations, of course, you, it's better if you keep all the others. Then one main feature of these theories is that we will have a modified conservation law of total momentum, which, which could be given by the modified addition of the momenta. And again, if you want to do phenomenology, you will just expand to, to the first order in, in the in the in the parameter lambda. And of course, um, what people have tried to do, as I said in, the, in some previous slides, is to make this compatible with the uh, relativity principle. 
So we will also have, in general, the formal Lorentz transformation. The most developed approach is the consideration of Hopf algebras, uh, for example, in the case of Kappa Poincare. And in that case, basically, what you have to do is to add to the usual product and the unit, you have to add a coproduct. Yeah. Okay, um, that you have uh, uh, the action of of the Lorentz of the Lorentz group. On... You don't have extra Okay. Uh, well, so then let me change the word, and I will say um, what we're with the Lawrence, with the Lawrence, with the Lawrence. Okay. The translation, yeah. Will be curved, and will be given by by this modification uh, of the addition, of the composition law. Okay. So what I was saying is that we will basically need the coproduct, which will give or will be or will set the modified addition law in our models and if you want to go to to the mathematical point of view well we have a b algebra and you have to to make this this diagram commute i'm not going into the details i'm just going to cite an example i'm taking the example of the symmetric basis given in a paper by lukierski in the 90s in that case they have compute a k -simer uh, of the algebra, and it was given in momentum space by this quantity, a sinh square minus minus sp squared in the spatial directions. Um, and again, they have also computed the, the deformed composition of, of momentum. Going forward, the question is how can one introduce fermions in, in that approach? And this was answered. Um, ah, well, I'm setting the article here by Novitsky, Torace, uh, and, and another guy. I don't remember his name. Basically, the question is if, in the usual case, we introduce fermions by adding um, a finite dimensional representation in that way of the Lorentz group, what should we do in this? modify situation and the answer was well consider the coproduct for example the coproduct of the um, of the boost consider it and then if you want to add a fermion there you will just have to trade all the quantities in the right hand side of the tensor product by the finite dimensional representations of the Lorentz group and that's what, what they did. In that way, they obtained this result, the result in equation five. And they could also derive the Dirac operator from their approach, which is uh, invariant and then under the application of Lorentz transformation. In our case, we will try to, to give a more, let's say, geometrical approach. We are basing our a result uh, in a paper by Amelino Camellia from the 2011. Uh, I think Glickman is not here, but he was also related in, he was also a collaborator in this paper, and there was also some, some other people. We are also based on the paper by Carmona, and you can also see the ideas, some related ideas by Glickman 2002, and there was a suggestion to include uh, this paper by Majid, who, who wrote. Uh, let's say a thought about these ideas in, in this paper from to uh, 1000 from 1999. Um, okay, well, the basic idea is that if you want to have a, a dispersion relation, relation and you want to work in curved momentum space, you don't have a lot of quantities there. The basic one is distance. You have distance, you can define distance, and that's a scalar. 
And if you have some symmetries, well, you may define also some invariances in the theory. And for example, you will have, if you want to have the Lorentz generators, and if you also want to have some translations on that space to give you the modified composition law, then you have some, some sort of Poincare invariance, and you will have 10 isometries of the metric. And you know, because uh, of classical results, that the only possibilities would be Minkowski, the theater, or anti the theater. The next step was to consider what is the relation of, of the modified composition law with geometrical quantities in, in that space. And in, in some sense, what you see there in equation six is the idea that, that the notion of this modified law is some sort of of translating the momenta in some modified way by this connection that you define, for example, at the, at the origin, and that would give you the composition law. And then you, you can try also to, to give a meaning for quantities beyond the origin, and that's also doable. So um, with these considerations, you can do, you can work in the following way. You define a momentum metric, for example, of the theater. You compute the composition law. Basically, you, you have to, to look or to solve the killing equations. Um, and therefore, you can simply compute the composition laws, the modified composition laws in this theory. You can also check that this metric, for example, is related to the kinematics of kappa one carré in the symmetric basis. Basically, you have to compute the casimir. And if you do compute the casimir defined as the square distance, you obtain this result, basically a function of the piece. Um, if you compare with the, with the casimir that I have shown a couple of slides ago, you will see that they're related just by one is being the fun a function of the other. So that's it. If you redefine the mass, you obtain the same result. There is a comment here. Um, as you can see, there is, um, once you choose a metric in the theater space, you can choose different composition laws. And if you choose different composition laws, for example, you could get a Snyder instead of Kappa Poincare. In this particular basis, what uh, you see is that the composition law for Snyder and for Kappa and are different, and therefore they would give they will give uh, some different uh, some different connections in this space. You will also see it here maybe when I will talk about Fermi, which is coming uh, in a couple of slides. So uh, if you want, you can also define an action in in momentum space. You can also see that the expression is covariant, which has been uh, a discussion in the literature for a while, I would say. You can also see that you have invariance on the Lorentz transformations. And, and that, that is a trivial, let's say, proof. So let's go to the Dirac equation. What we wanted to do is to obtain some sort of modified Dirac equation in this setup. I'm just writing this in this way. Let's say some sort of gammas should be there. Some sort of momentum should be there. And there should be a spinner also on the, on the left-hand side. The question was then how to obtain, for example, the momentum, that sort of moment. What is PMU? Well, you, again, you don't have many choices in, in the momentum space. The one that we found more suitable was to define this single, single function in momentum space. So, so you see there that basically we are, we are taking the, the derivative of, of single function. Um, and in that way, we will, in some sort of, of we expect to, to, to have invariance, to have covariance, sorry. The next question was 
what should the gamma mu be? And we find a solution by requiring the Lorentz representation to be local, local in momentum space. So we are introducing a fermion, a Dirac fermion in momentum space by introducing a local Lorentz representation in momentum space. So we introduce a field line in momentum space. We introduce the usual gamma matrices. So there you have Greek index uh, for vectors and latent indices for, for internal, for local uh, quantities. And you see that the gamma mu's, as in the usual case, gives the metric if u anti commutant. The next question is how can we compare these with the Hopf algebraic approach? You can see by the very definition of the, of the modified composition law that if the metric was defined such as uh, giving the Minkowski metric at the origin, well, the composition law gives automatically a tetrad, a preferred tetrad. And that's the definition that we are taking for the tetrad. If you do so, we go to the next slide and we obtain a Dirac equation. And you will tell me, well, uh, this means nothing. You have obtained a Dirac equation. What's next? We have realized that the Casimir in the Hopf algebraic approach was different. So if we take that Casimir instead of the one that we have defined, we obtain exactly the result in the Hopf algebraic approach. There is still uh, one comment if you want to, to square, um, um, I mean, in the usual case, the Dirac operator, you will obtain the Casimir of the scalar case. And so basically, let me summarize what I have been doing. You have Kappa Poincare. You may take the Hopf algebraic approach. And therefore, you may want to define a finite dimensional representation in the co-product and in the end you obtain your Dirac equation or otherwise you may take the other way consider a curved momentum space define a local Lorentz representation for the fermions and you get to the same point there are a couple of comments still um, the fact that we were squaring the, the Dirac equation is quite general so you can do it and obtain again the the Casimir of the scalar case. Again, you can define some action and see that if you use a variational method, you obtain the Dirac equation. And still another comment is that you may consider Pinos in Snyder in the same way. Well, it could be the case. Um, okay. Okay. You mean in the approach that you were taking in your paper from from last year? That one. And have you written a uh, written down a Dirac equation? Okay, maybe we can discuss this in, in a couple of minutes. Okay, um, I think this would be the last slide of remarks from the Dirac equation. So basically what I I, we have obtained is uh, an equation that was invariant and the deformed Lorentz transformations. We have also seen that this covariant. And um, we also introduced discrete symmetries basically by, by taking the 
the action of the, the parity, time, the time reversal and the charge conjugation operators in, in usual case, but going to, to momentum space. And then we have seen that the theory will be invariant under these symmetries if some additional conditions are satisfied with I'm writing down in equation eight for parity and time reversal and in equation nine to for for charge conjugation. This is still another another subtlety there because we have also to choose a change in lambda. I mean to introduce a sign in lambda in doing this charge conjugation, but still you can see that for rather general metrics and um, you will you will satisfy this condition so in principle it seems like we will have the invariance under the three of them so let me go to the conclusions uh, basically you can see what what i was talking about in, in this talk i was trying to motivate the idea that one could work in momentum space instead of for a certain class of models in, instead of working in the non-commutative with non-commutative coordinates and still obtain some interesting results from from the physical point of view but also from the from the mathematical point of view maybe you, you have seen for example in the case of the computation of vacuum energies that there is some sort of relation that is, is not clear between between the spectral properties of the momentum space time and, and our computation. And lastly, we have also shown that there is another interpretation for, for fermions in this kind of theories, which is this local representation in momentum space time. And if you want, well, I have written some, some dots, the dots. Um, you can think how to add potentials, interactions, in that case with fermions if you want to have the conservation of the total momenta with the modified additional law and so on and so forth so thank you thank you quite some discussion during the talk oh yeah sorry Thank you. From the action you wrote, it says that this model has tachyons and negative energies and so on, because one integrates over devotee in the action. Uh, so you don't see the Marshall condition anywhere. Okay? The positive energy Marshall condition anywhere in that action. Okay? So I'm not clear what is the sector about this Iraq operator you are writing. Okay? The second question is lambda to minus lambda under C. That is not an automorphism of the Lorentz group. There is no such automorphism because it will also change the identity of the Lorentz group to minus one. So one can easily check that it is not an automorphism. Lambda times one is one. Lambda apply C, you get minus lambda times minus one. Is minus lambda equal to plus lambda? That is wrong. Yeah? So that is not an automorphism. So I am not understanding what you are saying. Okay. Um... Let's say for, for the first question, um, we have been trying to, to understand a little bit more um, what's going on there. And we were trying, for example, um, here you can see that we were trying to, in some sort, uh, introduce some constraint on the modes. In this case, what we were trying to do is to introduce some, some vector t and trying to just retain all the contributions for with, with positive energies and maybe this is related to what you were asking right cd well if you have a uh, okay yeah um yeah Okay, that's a nice question. Um, uh, 
that's an, that's a nice question. Um, before before telling if it is self adjoint or not, we have to define Hilbert space. And actually, that was what we were trying with this formula. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Well, um, it will depend uh, on, on the coordinate. In principle, there could be it, it could be negative. Yeah, that, that's the point. Yeah. 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 That, that's a good point that we have to say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, but on, when you write CSR as a curved momentum, this deals with other aspects that you have a two uh, invariant parameters. This is the definition of this. Mm -hmm. Unless you have your own definition of this, because, because if you have CSR and you use, for example, uh, one commute space time geometry, then of course you get a curved momentum. So it's, now let's say more. One commuter could space time and just uh, momentum. That would be for me, uh, I mean, the three positions, not DSR. Because DSR, by the way, is a vague node. It's a very? It's a, it's a mathematics, the algebraic is a vague node. Because oh. it, it only says that you have a, besides uh, like velocity, you have, you have uh, a blank mass, yeah? But you don't say how technically you realize DSR. Okay, well, okay, I will take into account. <laughs> yeah, you, you have. Okay, um, you mean this transformation? Okay, w what we have checked is so that. Lambda times one would be two. You put the lambda, so it takes this five. Okay, so lambda times one, you put the lambda. Mm -hmm. Apply two on both sides. One side goes to two, minus lambda, I want to say. Minus lambda times minus one, because one also changes. But minus one lambda is again goes to the same lambda. So you see, it's not operating correctly on minus lambda. It's automatically removed, not to minus lambda. Or not everything to go with lambda. The product of the is an automatic, no? Yeah, I, I don't see your point. What we have checked is that still we retain a in the theta metric, that was our point. But um, if you use lambda going to minus lambda, no, 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 lambda. Uh, maybe that was your uh, the problem. Lambda is the the parameter that the, the forms the space. Um, I should have written, for example, here. Yeah. Okay. Let me thank Sam again.
Menschen an, an Quanten groups. Quantum groups, yes. Yeah. Thanks, Pranjo. Um, first of all, let me thank all the people who made this wonderful workshop possible. Um, I'm always having a great time here. So yeah, this is the first thing I wanted to say. The second thing, you might realize that this is a different title and I'm sorry for that, yeah. Um, I changed this basically last minute, so I won't talk about quantum principle bundles, but um, more about Levi-Civita and uh, some quantum gravity. And the reason that I changed it is that there is a, a very recent uh, preprint uh, that I wrote with Paolo, who is also here in the audience, not yet, but he might come soon. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. So I thought it might be better to talk about this here. Um, okay, so what is this talk about? So the goal would be to give some mathematical model for quantum gravity so that we are somehow building a playground, let's say, um, to do uh, quantum gravity on uh, for some of our favorite non-commutative non spaces. Yeah? And in particular, um, the spaces we will look at uh, will have a quasi triangular uh, Hopf algebra symmetry. So it's kind of slightly more general than what we saw in the first talk, where there was this R matrix that was squaring to one. But here we are trying to be slightly more general and still have some notions of metric compatibility and Levi-Civita connection. So the problem that uh, we are having um, is that, okay, on the side of differential geometry, quantum spaces are rather well understood. Yeah? And I will point out what, um, what is the recipe, so the ingredients that we are having for those spaces. So there, is, there are not so many problems here, but on the side of quantum Riemannian geometry, it is really not clear how to approach, or there's no general unique approach to what, for example, metrics are or what uh, levi civita connection should be. So I will also talk about this. First of all, so here, this is the first part that is uh, rather well under understood. So our um, space of observables is just an algebra where you could have non commutativity associated with unital algebra. Um, differential forms will be modeled by a what we call a differential calculus. So that's simply a differential graded algebra, such that the zero forms give you back your space, are just your space that you started with. Connections are also very simple. Those are just linear maps from your one forms to the tensor product of your one forms, satisfying a Leibniz rule. There are very natural notions of torsion and curvature. For example, I wrote torsion here. It's just this sum of the wedge product with the connection plus the differential. And curvature is, as usual, just the square of your connection. And you can do more. There are very nice notions of vector fields. And yeah, differential geometry here is uh, kind of known. Yeah? So here the problem is, what should a metric be? So this should be some kind of element in omega one tends to omega one with some symmetry property, maybe some non-degenerate property, but it is not clear how to formulate this in this very general setting. And it's also not clear what metric compatibility should be. So how to extend our connection to this tensor product so that we can write something like Nabla G equals zero. Okay, and let me first give you some uh, um, approaches, let's say that solve this uh, problem so that give you a good notion of uh, metric and Levi-Civita connection. First of all, so, so this slide here is very similar to what we saw in the first talk. Now, so this is the twist or triangular structure setting. Um, okay, so this is based on early work of the Julius West group and also by um, two people who are sitting right here. Yeah. And um, so this year was for the twisted case. 
and the try angular case was um, solved. I did something about this in my PhD thesis, and then later on, Paolo kind of uh, finished the picture. So this, those are the references. The framework is the following. So your algebra now has a try angular hop algebra symmetry. Um, so this is just a hop algebra, and we saw the definition in this workshop several times. And this R here is a universal R matrix, um, such that the inverse is simply given by the tensor flip. And so this R matrix then gives you a grading operation that we saw in the first talk can be used to um, deform your usual classical setting, let's say. For those algebras, there's a canonical differential calculus, yeah, and this is modeled on uh, what is called graded derivations. So those are endomorphisms of your algebra that satisfy a kind of twisted Leibniz rule. You can see here this first term is the usual one, x is acting on a, but in the second one there's this R matrix uh, twist, and this is needed because you can see that x somehow has to pass through A in order to act on B. And that's why this grading appears. And you can prove this. Um, they, yeah, those braided derivations have very nice properties. They are closing a braided Lie algebra and dual to this Lie algebra. You can do this calculus here. OK. Um, having this braiding coming from the R, it is clear what a metric should be because we are simply saying a metric is an element here that is um, so sigma r. I mentioned this is the braiding corresponding to the r matrix r. So it's an, just an element here that has a sigma r symmetry. If I act on g, I simply get back g. And then some non the degeneracy property that I don't spell out here. And also for connections, it's very easy to um, write down a um, formula for the action on the tensor product. So similarly to the braided derivations, we simply say, okay, Nabla acts on the tensor product like plus the first on the first tensor and for the second, we need this uh, braiding operation here. Sigma R, okay, I mentioned, but it was not clear. Sorry about that. So R is the, um, R is the triangular structure and Sigma R is the braiding corresponding to R. So this is basically just the, the, R, the R matrix acting after flip. So you flip two tensors and then you act. And this gives you a, a more general flip operator. You can think of, yeah, like for vector space, it would simply be the flip, but here it can be definitely more general. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so uh, and I should mention, okay, in this setting, um, using these notions that I just gave you, it is known that um, you can find, so for every metric, there is one and only one levi chivita connection. Yeah. Connection. And, um, okay, one more setting I would quickly like to uh, mention is the one that uses bimodule connections and central metrics. And this was introduced by those people here. And so let me just quickly tell you what a bimodule connection is. So here you do not only have the right Leibniz rule that I showed you here, but you also have a Leibniz rule on the left. So kind of here, if a, a function is on the left, you first get a linear term. And in the second term, this a different kind of sigma appears because a bimodule connection always comes with some a by module map sigma that could be a braiding, but here this is more general. You just need an, an a by module map. And in, in this setting, it's, it's, it's most natural to talk about central metrics. And there are several results in this setting. For example, for SLQ2, um, it is known that there's something like a weak Levi Civita connection, weak in the sense that here, you need some kind of framing and co-framing of your calculus such that you can write down a weak notion of what metric compatibility would be. And yeah, it is known that for this definition, you can find one and only one Levi-Civita connection, for example, for SLQ2. 
Um, there are other approaches, but we are just um, yeah, on fuzzy spaces, for example, Modoa, yeah, um, for central modules and tame differential calculi that are kind of close to the classical case, but only with a slight non commutativity. Um, let me maybe just mention this last one. Um, so this is kind of nice. This is using the, the um, matrix quantum groups. And for, for those, uh, all the differential calculi, the covariant ones that are classified by Branio, he gave us the classification. So that's why some people figured out that you can sum up only by, by looking at the few possibilities that you have, you can write down um, or you can prove that there's just, um, that you can find a levi Vita connection. And building on those ideas, let's say, of this uh, last paper here by um, Bomwick and his student, who were trying to um, give you a more general notion of levi Vita. And okay, so here I'm telling you what I'm actually uh, uh, wanting, what I want to do in this, in this talk is this, um, okay give you a notion of what metric compatibility in the sense of uh, the strong case, not the weak one, so really nabla g equals zero. What this is for general quantum groups, so A will be equal to H, a Hopf algebra. And this, this means that here we don't need any uh, quasi triangular structure, and we also do not need G to be a central um, element. This will be rather general. In particular, we will prove um, existence and uniqueness of levi civita connections for some classes of uh, metrics. And we will also get the example of SLQ2. Yeah, and as I said, a strong version, not a weak one, but that was not. The main tools that I'm going to use is the sum of connection. So a kind of braided derivation formula for the tensor product of connections. And the second tool here is a direct sum decomposition of this um, space of one form, tensor of one form into symmetric forms and the wedge product. And okay, I was mentioning it, it briefly. This is, uh, so this last part is uh, really based on ideas developed in this paper. So we owe gratitude to them. Okay, so the plan of the talk is the first part, and I apologize for this first part, will be a little bit technical. So well, this is definitely more on the mathematical side. So I have to give you the, a mathematical rigid framework where to build upon these, these um, yeah, these um, braided der derivation uh, formula. So we, we have to talk a little bit about uh, closed monoidal categories, but I promise I will make it quick. And if you want to uh, have a quick nap, that's also fine. So just uh, I just want to make sure that we are building upon a, a rigid mathematical theory, no? a rigorous theory. And OK, so good. And then later on, we will talk about this sum of connection that will be the main tool for the levi civita And in the last part, I will um, actually prove existence of some of those levi civita connections. Okay, so this is the first of the technical slides. So um, our setting is the following. We are starting with a Hopf algebra H with a co-product um, uh, delta here with epsilon, the co-unit and with antipod S. Um, we will always, um, um, take Hopf algebras with, that have an invertible antipod, the standard assumption, and K will be any field we are working on. So let's have a look at the monoidal category of right H co modules. So this just means I'm, I'm having spaces that I can co act on, and I have a tensor product of those co modules that will give me a co module. Yeah? So tensor product of two co modules is a co module. I will denote um, such co modules uh, like M and the co action like this here. So it, this is a map from M into M temperature. Okay, here we're having an external homofunctor, which basically just means the morphisms of this um, category are given by co linear maps, which is 
really just a dual notion of what a linear map is. So you can write it down in, in terms of this coaction. This, this simply means that a linear map is collinear. Um, what is more interesting, and, and I think not that well known, even since this um, notion has been introduced in the 90s, is this um, uh, what are the corresponding internal homes? Um, because they are given by rational morphisms. And I have to explain what those are. So for modules, you always have a notion of an adjoint action on linear maps. And this gives you an action on linear maps. So you can see the space of linear maps between two spaces as a linear map, uh, sorry, as a module itself. Yeah? So it's an object in, the, in your categorical framework. For coactions, things are slightly more complicated since you, you can write down an adjoint coaction. This looks like this. The problem is this would be a map from linear maps from M to N into this bigger space here. And for a coaction, what you need is that this actually splits in this way that you can somehow get out this tensor H, yeah? that you have a splitting. And in general, this will not be, you won't get this. So what, Ulbricht did, he simply made this definition saying, I only take a look at those linear maps such that the image of the adjoint coaction is really in this space here. And those linear maps are called rational, rational morphisms. Uh, if you don't understand part of what I'm saying, it's no problem uh, later on. Th the point is that connections will be such rational morphisms and we just need a way to coact on connections. Huh? So um, proposition that I would like to state is that, um, okay, so here, if you look at rational morphisms, they are an object in MH, meaning I can coact on elements here. And the invariants under this coaction are exactly the collinear maps. So this also tells us that this space is non-empty. You have the co-linear maps and probably more. Evaluation and con Catenation are uh, morphisms here. Okay, this just means that everything is nice and cool in there. Okay. Um, remark, so yeah, more a mathematical remark. What this uh, proposition tells you is that MH, so the core modules with the usual tensor product and with the internal homomorphism of rational morphisms is a closed monoidal category. So in plain language, this just means, okay, you have a tensor product of core modules and you can look at linear maps between co-modules and this space of linear maps is again a co-module, nothing else. This is what this, what this means, yeah. Um, I have to introduce a covariant uh, H modules. So those are spaces where you're having a co-action and an action with the following com uh, compatibility. Um, this is written here meaning that the, the co-action is a linear map. Yeah? And I denote those spaces so like, like this here. So you have a right edge co-action and the right edge action and compatibility. And for example, you can prove that if M is a finitely generated right edge module, then the right rational morphisms that are also right linear, those are exactly the right linear maps. So in a sense um, for right edge, linear maps, you don't even need this notion of rational morphisms because you can always coact on a right edge linear map using the adjoint coaction. Um, okay, some notation, um, let's see. So next step, so we were having right covariant right modules. Uh, we want more, we want bi covariant bi modules. So those are um, H bi modules that are also H by co modules, and you have the following compatibility, which simply states that your co actions are bi linear maps. And category is uh, written here with morphisms being H bi linear and H bi co linear. Um, this is a rather nice um, setting because here you can prove that you actually have a braided monoidal category. So you have a God given uh, braiding operator that you can write down explicitly here, which we call uh, Voronovich braiding up here in this paper. Yeah. And okay, you can make this category closed if you take the internal home 
functor of bright age linear maps. Um, okay. So let's see. Um, for for those bases, um, since we are having now a closed braided monoidal category, so okay, we have uh, linear maps that are objects. We have a braiding. We have a tensor product. We have a lot. In particular, we can build a very nice tensor product of internal homo homomorphisms um, that is written here. It's a braided tensor product. And um, to explain what it does, maybe one can take a look at this formula here. So you take a linear map phi, a linear map psi, and you want to act on the tensor product. And how do you do this in a nice way, in the sense that this gives you, again, a bilinear, bi co linear map? You do it in this way here. So psi wants to act on n, but it has to pass through m. We saw this formula in one of the first slides. So what is happening is you are using, again, the braiding. Oh, sorry. Maybe I didn't explain what this alpha means. So um, this is important. So I, I will use this notation here to write the braiding. So if I act with sigma Voronovich on m tensor n, I simply write alpha n, alpha n. So this is exactly what we have here. So I have to braid m and psi. And I'm getting a nice operation in the sense that, so this tensor product is a morphism here. It's left linear, it's right linear, it's left and right collinear. It's associative. And yeah, so it's a very good operation for our internal homomorphisms. And OK, this works even more in general in every closed braided monoidal category. So that's a big problem. And this took us quite some time to figure out how to solve it. And the problem is connections are not right age linear maps, of course, as a second term. So we cannot use this very nice tensor product. We have to come up with something new. And this is what I'm going to, to do in the rest of this talk. Um, we will use a lifting of Modernovich braiding. So we call this sigma with no W here, just sigma. And lifting simply means that we have this diagram here. So if you uh, quotient or project down, um, you will get back Modernovich braiding. You know? And explicitly, this is how it looks like. So you take M tensor N. This is now really the tensor product over your field, not over the algebra H. And you map it here to N tensor M, and this is what you get. Now you can prove. Um, so first of all, this is not a braiding. Even if I write sigma, it's not a braiding. But still, it's really close to it. For example, it's a morphism here. We get everything, but it is not left linear. Um, we have that it's middle linear, even if this is not the tensor product over H. And we have one of the hexagons. For a braiding, you would have two, but we are losing the second one. And so the miracle somehow is that we can still use this braiding, or not braiding, like close to a braiding, this lifting of this uh, braiding, and everything works. So the definition of our new tensor product is this here. And so here, the difference to the previous one is that here we have really rational morphisms. So they are not H linear, they're only K linear, and you can coact on this basis. And everywhere you have the tensor product over K, not the tensor product over your, your algebra. The formula is exactly the same. So you are braiding Psi and M. And OK, this is how it looks like explicitly. Yeah, the miracle is, this is the, the first theorem that I would like to show you is that this is a very nice operation that has all of the properties that we want. Namely, this operation is a morphism here. It's left linear, right linear, and bi collinear, and associative. And we can really use it for more general maps, not only for H linear maps. In particular, we can use it for connections. This is what we are going to see later. And OK, you can quotient this down to the tensor product over H. Maybe here, I'm just um, say quickly, um, yeah, if you if you go back to the tensor product over H here, um, we call this um, operation tensor hat. And we have still all of the nice properties that we had previously. In particular, as a sanity check, let's say, we get back the usual um, Voronovich braided tensor product if we take H linear maps. But here, as I said, 
those maps could be much more general. So this was the technical part. I'm very sorry for that. Now it, I hope it will be more fun what is up to come now. Um, so let's fix a bi-covariant first order differential calculus on a Hopf algebra. Um, bi-covariant means that, yeah, simply means you have uh, a left action and, sorry, a left coaction and a right coaction such that the differential is collinear corresponding to those coactions. And okay, I gave the definition of what a connection is in this setting here. So just a linear map satisfying this Leibniz rule. And for this, you can define a natural extension to higher order forms, simply using this uh, formula here. So basically on M, you, you act with your connection and on your higher order forms, you can act with the differential. And what you can prove is this satisfies this kind of graded Leibniz rule. Um, yes, so you have a linear term and then you have a non-linear addend um, that has a yeah, the sign of the, the form omega here. A comment I would like to make on this is that, um, okay, this definition is pretty nice. It, it works well, but the independent term are not well defined. For example, if I take a look at this last term here, um, it is not well defined on the tensor product over H since B gives, gives me an extra term from the Leibniz tool. And this two only makes sense if you put uh, the combination of the two terms since the, the two Leibniz rules somehow, the Leibniz rule of D and the Leibniz rule of the Nabla cancel each other. Huh? What we can do now is we can use our tensor product tensor hat that we gave in the previous definition. And um, two things are happening. First of all, you can prove that you get back this, the same um, formula. So not the same formula, but um, so this right-hand side here using tensor hedge instead of tensor H gives the same, so it is equal to two. <laughs> That's what I'm going to say, sorry. And the, so, we can also use this as a definition. That's what I want to say. That it gives us the same Nabla bullet. But why is this better? It is better because here, every single term makes sense. It's well defined on this quotient. Since here you saw we have this operation take a rational morphism and you get a well um, defined operation on the tensor product over H. So that's why this definition is maybe a bit better. Okay, so now curvature, um, as I said in the first slide, I think it's just the square of your connection and torsion, this combination with the differential and the wedge product. And okay, this gives you right in your maps. It's, it's an easy exercise that you can prove this. Uh, let's look at an example, a canonical one. So for every bicovariant bimodule, I think I didn't say what this is. So this is just a bimodule. Uh, so an, an H by module that has is also an H by four module, and you have the compatibility of this uh, action and coaction. And for every such bicovariant by module, um, you have a canonical flat connection that you can write down explicitly. Uh, it's a very nice formula, I think, that uh, you simply use the antiport and the coaction. So this zero, one, and two just means I, I coact twice on an element M. And you can prove this is a flat right connection. We can also get a canonical torsion free connection. And for this, we just have to choose a basis of left co invariant one forms. Um, and this gives us some structure constants via the Katamaura formula. And then using those structure constants, CKIJ, you can define this connection here with a C, uh, superscript C. And you can prove that this is a torsion free connection. So, canonically, you have this. Um, okay, a lemma. Um, yes, going back to the rational morphisms. If you have a bicovariant by module M that is finitely generated as a, let's say, right H module, you can prove that any connection on M is a rational morphism, meaning I can always coact on such connections and I can use our tensor product 
um, yeah, what was the, the goal of the, why we made this definition, yeah. And okay, the, the, the proof is rather simple. I mean, you know that every connection is the, can be seen as the sum of the, one of the canonical connections that we saw in, the, in this slide here and a linear map. You can prove that the canonical connection is uh, rational. You can simply do this by hand. And we were uh, in one of the previous theorems, we also saw that every right age linear map is rational. So also the sum is rational. Um, so every connection is rational. Very good. Um, another 10 minutes, I see. Okay, yes. I have to speed up, yeah. <laughs> so using those canonical connections, I can also do something nice. Uh, namely, I can, um, okay, I first observe that the canonical connection satisfies, um, satisfy this equation here. So the canonical connection on the tensor product and the canonical connection on M and on N they are connected via this formula. And this will be our toy module for the sum of connections. So for a general connection, so let's take a connection on M, a connection on N, and I make the definition of sum of connection um, by saying, okay, take the difference of the connection M with the canonical one, that's a linear map. So I can use this uh, braided tensor product, Modernovich one, I do the same thing here also linear map so I can use this tensor product here and here I add the canonical connection on the tensor product okay. and that's that's the notion that would be a very natural notion of what the um, sum of connections so the connection on this tensor product module would be what I don't like about this is that it needs this canonical connections it's somehow a choice and we would like to get rid of it and this can be done using this tensor head tensor product. Um, namely, you make simply this definition, mimicking the canonical connection, but now using this tensor head. And what we proved is that, okay, those two different definitions are actually the same thing. So both coincide. And okay, the theorem says, you take a given two connections, you can build this uh, sum of connection that is a connection on the tensor product and both notions of sum of connection coincide. We also calculated the curvature, it's written here, like the first two are the classical terms if uh, sigma would just be the flip and then you have those two extra terms that are vanishing in the classical limit. Okay, since time is running late, I will be rather quick on this um, linear algebra slide. Um, okay, we would like to have a decomposition of our space of one forms. Yeah? So this omega one tensor omega one, we would like this to split into symmetric forms and uh, two forms. And this can be done in, in case your uh, braiding is a diagonalizable braiding. Yeah? And this will be part of our assumption that we say, let's have a finite amount of eigenvalues and eigenspaces such that this de decomposition holds. And this is, for example, the, the case in, in all the nice matrix um, quantum groups of the ABCD series. So in our famous, uh, not famous, our um, favorite examples, we can have such a decomposition. And okay, we can get projectors. You can even write down explicitly how they look like um, using Modernovich braiding. And what I want, the last thing I want to mention on this slide is on vector fields, which, okay, I will also quick are just the dual module of one form. You get a corresponding decomposition, which is really just dual and everything connects very nicely. So that's um, using this um, vector space decomposition, you can have a, a, a bunch of connections. So maybe just have a look at this here. So every okay, starting with a connection on omega, we can build a sum of connection, giving us a connection on the tensor product. And then using the projections pi, we get a connection on the symmetric tensors, a connection on the wedge product, and two linear maps. Those are the ones with uh, subscript one, two, and two, one. And okay, the connection is determined by those four maps. You can do everything with the dual connection that is given in terms of this 
formula here. So just uh, mimicking um, yeah, the classical differential geometry. You get a left connection now. This is this with the, with the bar on the left side. You can do the, the same decomposition and prove that everything is dual in a very nice way in the sense that those um, the right connection on the symmetric tensors is dual to the left connection on the symmetric tensors. And same thing for the wedge product in those linear maps. So now since time is running short, this is the main definition. Uh, yeah, and maybe as a um, take home message would be trying to understand or make sense of this definition here. So a, um, okay, this, those are two parts. Yeah, the first part is about the metric. The second part is about the Levitivita connection. So, um, what is a metric? I'm, I will give the definition on vector fields, but you could dually also do it on forms. Let's, yeah, it's a little bit easier to talk about it for a vector field. So we take G as a sigma symmetric element, meaning that if I act with sigma on G, I simply get like G. And I only want um, the following non degeneracy property that G sharp is an isomorphism. What is G sharp? It's a map from omega one into the vector field defined by um, pairing G with a one form. You know, so G is like tensor product of two vector fields. If I pair it with one, one form, I'm left with one vector field. So I'm getting a map here. You can easily see this is a right linear map. So I want this to be an isomorphism uh, of right modules. And really, we don't need anything else. We, we don't need that G is central or has any other properties, only this. Then a Levitivita connection, we have everything to say um, to make this definition. It's just a right connection on one form such that the dual connection and the part that corresponds to the symmetric tensors vanishes on G. And it makes a lot of sense to look at this one because by definition, G is a symmetric tensor. So we should take the connection that corresponds to this object here. And then, okay, torsion free, we can say this. Um, and if we have both properties, we call such a connection Levitivita. So let's come to some results. We need a um, we need a tool um, for a Levitivita theorem to work, and this this tool is another linear map, this capital Phi G, and um, let's say what this is it's somehow an identification of those two vector spaces. Yeah, it's the, the definition is given here. It's basically mimicking our sum of connections but now with a linear map. Yeah? And the main theorem, or one of the main theorems is that in case this capital Phi G is, an, uh, is a bijection, then you can prove that for, for this metric here, you have one and only one Levitivita connection according to our definition. And the explicit form is given here. So you start with the canonical torsion free connection, and then you're adding this linear map that you can see deep depends on the differential, the, the metric, again, this canonical torsion free connection and this capital Phi. You know, this, so take this for the moment as a black box that's a linear map corresponding or depending on the metric. Okay, that's very nice. Um, so here I don't go through the proof. I just wanted to show you the proof is rather simple. It's really, it fits on one slide. And so here I'm hiding nothing. It's really the full proof is here. Yeah. Um, okay, um, in the last two minutes maybe, I, let, let me talk about um, a class of metrics that we can, um, that we can get here. So one more definition we call a, uh, metric sigma central if it's central corresponding to this braiding operator. So if you if you braid G with any one form omega, it's just the flip. Yeah. This is what we call sigma central. And for example, you can prove any sigma central metric is central, and every central bi-co-invariant metric is sigma central. 
And for such sigma central metrics, you can show that um, capital Phi G is an invertible map if and only if this, pro this projection map is an invertible map. So what is nice here is you have a um, sufficient condition for the existence of a Levi-Civita connection that is independent of the metric. Yeah. So here you you don't see the metric here. It's um, yeah, the proof is sketched here, but you don't have time. And um, the last thing I want to say maybe is this theorem and an example. Um, let's say that you have a metric and you know that um, the capital Phi G is an invertible map, so that you have Levi-Civita there. Then what we know is that for every conformally equivalent metric, meaning that if you take a second metric G prime that differs from G only by multiplication with an invertible function, so not a constant, but you can take any invertible function, then we know that also for this metric, there's one and only one Levi-Civita connection with the explicit formula given here. So in terms of the first Levi-Civita connection. Okay, the example, as I mentioned, we can show that for SLQ2 with the usual um, central by co-invariant metric. Yeah, this is a sigma central metric. So in particular, from our theorem, this tells us that for this metric, we have one and only one levi civita connection. And it's given by this formula here. You can write it down. Okay, um, uh, here are some references this is a yeah, recent paper that we put out. This is the paper of Bombik that uh, we took some inspiration from. And this is the student of Bombik, uh, some other nice paper. Okay, I think that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention. Okay, so questions, comments? Yes? Yeah, so I have to say I'm I'm not very good at examples. Um, so of course you could take um, so take any central metric, for example here. And so in principle every metric that is conformally equivalent to this metric. Uh, for this one we also have a Levi-Civita connection. The problem is for SLQ two there are of course not so many invertible functions. They are only the, the, the constant ones. So for the moment, I have to say, I don't have an explicit example, but of course, this will be the, the next step to broaden our, um, our yeah, examples that we have, that we have say, a, a more non-trivial theory, let's say. Yeah. More questions, comments? If no, then oh, thanks. I just would like uh, to comment uh, on uh, Andrei question. Uh, the, the, the slide that is exactly uh, showing here shows that uh, even any function, then uh, in any constant metric, you can construct a levi civita connection for such a, a rescaled DA function metric. So these are, uh, uh, so there, there are, in my opinion, plenty of examples. For example, just take that final metric G and multiply it for any function on SLQ2. Yes, yeah, so the problem is it has to be an invertible function. And so this was the thing that I mentioned, there are not so many for SLQ2, but yeah. Mm. Okay, so, oh, fine. A very short question. Can you, uh, having Levitch with a connection, can you compute the scalar curvature, for instance, or reach mm -hmm. the answer? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so should be possible, um, but we didn't do it. So, but this would be a nice follow up paper, I, I think. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, thank you, Thomas. Thanks.
Okay, so uh, our okay. last speaker today in the morning is uh, Anvesta Chakrabarti, and yeah, the title is Fingerprints of the Quantum Space Time in Pan Dependent Quantum Mechanics and Emergent Geometries. I hope I am audible. <clears throat> okay. Um, so I am Anisha Chakraborty. I'm a PhD student in Istanbul's National Center for Basic Sciences, mm -hmm. Kolkata. I want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here and present my work. So I don't think that uh, uh, to this audience, I need to motivate you about uh, why you should take a non-commutative space time. But as a passing comment, I would like to uh, cite the paper by Professor Primrose, where he has argued that if you take the quantum superposition of two different uh, stationary mass distributions um, as a feedback, uh, a la Einstein's GR, you would get uh, the superpositions of space-time space -time geometry. And that kind of space-time is likely to lose the translational symmetry. And uh, eventually, you would, you would get the uncertainty in time and energy and giving you the uh, time as operator. So time as an operator is an age-old problem in quantum mechanics, obviously. And so in this uh, work, our aim is to first provide a consistent formulation of quantum mechanics in non-commutative space-time, considering time as an operator. And secondly, uh, to study the effect of space-time non-commutativity on dynamics of a time-dependent system. Well, uh, if you take uh, a time-independent system in a non-commutative space, you see uh, there, are, uh, there are effects of non-commutativity seen in the dynamics of the system in propagators, the wave functions gets, uh, gets correction. But on the other hand, if you place such time independent system in non commutative space time, the dynamics is not affected. So it is interesting to study uh, to the, the, the time dependent system placed in a non commutative space time. And this is one of our motivation. And you may ask that, um, well, the effect of non commutativity becomes significant, significant at very high energy scale. So why take non relativistic quantum mechanics and model? Um, on non-commutative space time. So it is really intriguing to speculate that there should be some relics of the, um, of the effect of non-commutativity at low energy level. And recently uh, in this paper, uh, the authors have, shown, authors have shown that if you uh, take two harmonic oscillator system uh, separated by a distance D, and there is no other interaction rather than a linearized gravitational wave, they get the state of the two uh, coupled uh, oscillator gets uh, entangled. And where does this entanglement comes from? So one answer is the relic of uh, the, the uh, fingerprint of the quantum nature of the gravity. So this also motivated us to study some non relativistic system on quantum space time, especially Moyal type of uh, space time. So the summary is, uh, we have shown that a time dependent displaced harmonic oscillator system, uh, the model is based on these papers. So uh, when, when placed in a non-commutative space time, this gives rise to geometrical phase shift when evolved adiabatically. I will just uh, tell the plan of my talk. First, I will develop the usual quantum mechanics very quickly uh, from a classical toy model and uh, give a brief review and how uh, then I will just uh, discuss the non emergence of non-commutative symplectic structure through a classical toy model, and then set up the quantum mechanics of, uh, of non-commutative space-time using Hilbert-Schmidt operatorial formalism. Then I will place a displaced harmonic oscillator system in that space-time and see its adiabatic evolution, and so show that uh, the geometric phase emerges, which is not present otherwise if it is in usual space-time, and conclude with some comments. Okay, so these are basic, uh, very basic actually, and I will go through these things very quickly. So uh, if, we, if we try to treat uh, time and space in, on equal footing, I, I will just introduce tau, a new evaluation parameter in my system, which is monotonically increasing function of time. And uh, the action will just change, action will not be changed. The Lagrangian will change like this. So for example, if you take a generic Lagrangian, this is the kinetic term and this is the pot generic potential term. It will just be changed like this in terms of tau evalu evaluation parameter. So now uh, time and x, both are, both are my configuration space variable. And you can calculate the canonical momentum corresponding to position and time. 
Now uh, you can see that this uh, emerges as a uh, constraint of the system, constraint of the system, and you can now to calculate the total Hamiltonian, where sigma tau is the Lagrange multiplier enforcing the constraint. Now you can write the Lagrangian in first order form and uh, compute the Dirac brackets, and you can get the uh, usual uh, Heisenberg algebra at the le classical level. Well, now you can quantize by promoting to the promoting the variables to the level of operator and uh, Dirac brackets to the level of commutators. And here, as space time is commuting, we can obviously uh, introduce simultaneous eigenstates of time and space. And uh, these are the representation of the phase space variables. Now, um, note that this is uh, the, the, the any uh, arbitrary states psi and phi will follow the inner product of L2 R2 space, where the integration measures is both dt and dx. But now we will have a problem when we try to uh, discuss the probabilistic interpretation of quantum mechanics. Why? Because here psi goes to zero when t goes to in, in mod t goes to infinity, which is absurd. So what we do that we impose this uh, constraint on the physical wave function that this constraint annihilates the physical wave function, which actually uh, physically mean uh, that we demand the gauge invariance of the physical constraint. This is the generator of the tau evaluation basically. So by doing so and taking the uh, representation in this basis, we, are, we land up with Schrodinger equation. Now, if you uh, write the pro continuity equation and uh, you can see that rho, the probability density will be uh, finite only when we, when we consider the psi goes to in zero for mod x going to infinity, not mod t going to infinity. So basically we are uh, the, the physical wave function are the element of L2 R1 space, not L2 R2 space. So uh, till now we are carrying the L2 R2 space as a baggage. We are now leaving the baggage. We are uh, saying that the physical wave functions are L2 R2 and satisfy this in a spinner product. And at this stage, this Schrodinger, in the Schrodinger equation, we, the T is just the evaluation parameter as usual. Okay, <clears throat> and, uh, and, and PT and T are not the elements of our phase space variables anymore. We have uh, excluded them from the phase space variables. Okay, now quantum space time. So to the previous first order form of Lagrangian, if we now introduce, uh, include a, uh, turn timer like term in momentum space, theta is the coupling parameter, and run the Dirac analysis, you can see that at classical level, the, the Dirac bracket gives the non-commutativity between the positions and the usual Heisenberg algebra between X and P. So uh, now, okay, let us work with one plus one dimensional simplest system. Okay, so now we just quantize the Dirac brackets and uh, write the commutators, which is the total non-commutative Heisenberg algebra given by 17. To represent, them, to represent this algebra, we need a Hilbert space. So we first construct the uh, space of Fox states, which is created by this successive action of B dagger, where B is the linear combination of T and X operator. Just like uh, we do for harmonic oscillator with X and T. So, uh, but note that uh, this is only, this, this can furnish the representation of this uh, space-time algebra only. Note the total Heisenberg algebra because PT and PX representation needs adjoint action, so left action and right action, but this only provides the left action of an operator on this. So now we will construct. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, the HC. HC is not L2 of R2. I will just like con construct HQ now, which will be like L2 R2, which I discussed in the usual con uh, quantum mechanical setting. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 but. Yeah, yeah. Only the difference is T and X, uh, the eigenstates are not uh, uh, like uh, we had the commuting T and X before. Now we don't have only the differences. <clears throat> okay, sorry. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, now uh, yeah, we have a, we have we need a Hilbert space to represent this whole algebra. 
so we construct the space uh, of the um, uh, operators made out of the polynomials of x and t or equivalently b and b dagger but note that uh, these are all uh, unbounded operators and this is not a hilbert space as yet so we take the space of hilbert schmidt operators which are compact and bounded operators having finite hilbert schmidt norm and this is our space which is which is basically a subspace of a theta which can represent this total heisenberg algebra so this is basically uh, uh, like equivalent to l2 r2 space which i discussed earlier now uh, uh, i no it's not like yeah uh, yeah not the same hmm hmm Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. On on a different, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So uh, these are the representations of the phase space uh, operators on our uh, Hilbert space HQ. Just note that this angular kits are different from the round kits. So uh, the round kit element, uh, angular kits are element of HC and round kit elements are, ele these are elements of HQ. So uh, now uh, we need uh, something to, uh, so, so now we don't have the simultaneous eigenstate of T and X operator. What we have is coherent states. So we can construct the global sudarshan coherent states using the B and B dagger I introduced earlier. So this is an element of HC. Again, we need an element of HQ because the abstract state shy are now elements of HQ. So we take the outer product of this uh, Z belonging to HC, and this is my uh, coherent states for the HQ Hilbert space. You can normalize with this factor if you want to write it in terms of XT basis. This is basically borrow spaces, and you can check that it satisfies over completeness condition when um, uh, composed through the borrow star product, which, are not, which is a non-local star product given by this equation. Okay, so uh, I just want you to um, note that this T and X are the expectation value of T and X operator in the coherent state basis, not eigen from eigen value of T and X operator. Okay. Now uh, the inner product will be given by L2 star R2 here. The composition is with respect to Voros star product. And uh, here I want to uh, like make you uh, recognize the symbol. Shy of XT is the representation of an abstract case shy in the Hilbert space HQ in the Voros basis. So it is like calculated, it can be calculated like this in question 28. And uh, there is there you can also prove the isomorphism between the uh, uh, the symbol of two composite operator and the symbol of the in individual operator when um, it, it's uh, the multiplied with respect to the forest product. Okay, now as I shown before that I have this uh, constraint acting on the physical state shy. So it, it annihilates the it will annihilate the physical state shy. So we have the forest product forest basis now, and we can take the representation of the equation in that basis, which will give us a Schrodinger-like equation for non-commutative space-time. Here also we have the continuity equation and uh, these are the corresponding probability density and current. And now uh, the inner product in L2, now the physical states are living in L2 star R1 space rather than L2 star R2 space, because again, we will have problem with the pro probability density here. So to have a finite probability density, we need our physical states to be living in the space of L2 star R2, which is the, the inner product of which is given by this equation. Okay, now I am ready to um, um, ready to set up my forced har uh, displaced harmonic oscillator in the non-commutative space time. The Hamiltonian is given by this. Now we take uh, T and X to be non-commutative. The Hamiltonian will change a bit. Here we have taken the symmetric ordering. So an extra term arises here. And now we will take the uh, Schrodinger equation and write down it like this. We, we have just used the 
uh, isomorphism between the uh, comp symbol of composite operator. We have used that fact here. Now, <clears throat> uh, you can rewrite the equation like uh, equation 38, where you can see that this x theta and t theta, these are actually related with the x and t. These are classical or commutative. These are the expectation values of x and t in the coherent state basis, if you remember. So x theta, x and t theta t are related by a non-unitary transformation like this, where s is given here. So um, we have just used that and uh, represented our Schrodinger equation in terms of x theta and t theta. And it is interesting that uh, with, with this, uh, this, this operator gives you a map from L2 star R1 to L2 R1. So basically we can go from a non-commutative uh, uh, shy, like which is shy physical to a commutative one. And one can show for any generic state, actually the inner product between any two wave function is equal at a constant time slice. So basically, the, the, it, it is important to emphasize that the integrands are not equal because they are living in different algebra. This is non-commutative and this is commuted. Obviously, they are not equal, but the total integral is equal. So we will use this uh, fact to, uh, to set up an effective commutative theory from, the, from our non-commutative displaced harmonic oscillator. So we have just used this uh, non-unitary transformation to uh, write down our Schrodinger equation as 41. Now everything is written, in the, now basically the system is written in term of psi C, which is the element of L2 R1 space. Now, uh, if I write down the Hamiltonian, I, I am just rewriting the Hamiltonian. This is basically the addition of generalized harmonic oscillator plus some perturb time dependent perturbation linear in X and PX. Note that F and G has to be periodic because I will be uh, considering uh, the adiabatic evaluation of the system. And these are the uh, time dependent, B is not time dependent, A alpha and gamma are the time dependent parameters. So we can think of parameter space consisting of alpha, beta and gamma, and which varies periodically with capital time, capital time uh, T, which is the time period. And we can think of that the, the system Hamiltonian changes adiabatically through this parameter only when they uh, make a closed loop in the parameter space. So these are uh, just some calculations. So I, I have used this A and A dagger to semi-diagonalize the Hamiltonian. It is not totally diagonalized yet. Again, uh, and one more uh, thing is the speed, this uh, nature of PT is a bit uh, uh, ambiguous because it is not completely uh, slowly varying parameter. It consists of multiplication of slowly varying and fast varying parameter. So we needed to dispose uh, this PT and we did another uh, unitary transformation, time dependent unitary transformation show that the Schrodinger equation changes covariantly. And uh, with that transformation, we could land up with this Hamiltonian, which is completely diagonalized. And it is basically the Hamiltonian of of a, of a generalized harmonic oscillator. Now you can ask me that I have done a time dependent unitary transformation. Is my system the same anymore? <laughs> so uh, no, the, the dynamics will change, but as we are looking at the geometric phase, it won't be a problem. So that will be same for HC tilde and HC. Now I will be a bit quick. So here, these are the, uh, I have uh, used the Heisenberg picture. These are the differential equation of A and A dagger till now. We haven't uh, done any consideration of uh, the parameters slowly or fastly varying. Now, but now I will uh, just uh, dispose the first and higher order time derivative of the parameters alpha and gamma and uh, see the adiabatic evaluation. So if uh, we transport adiabatically along a closed loop gamma in time capital T, we will get that A dagger T will uh, acquire an extra phase, which is geometric in nature over and above this dynamical phase. If I write it in terms of our original variables, you can see that it explicitly depends on theta, the non-commutative parameter. So it is evident that if you switch off the non-commutativity, the geometric phase vanishes. And as a passing comment, I want to refer to this uh, paper also that which showed that whenever a system Hamiltonian can be written in terms of P-group generators, for example, SU11 or SU2, 
the geometric phase, occurrence of geometric phase is natural consequences. So we had our Hamiltonian also written in terms of SU11 generators. So it is natural that we are getting a geometric phase because, and also we are getting a dilatation like term, which is uh, not uh, necessary, but not sufficient condition to get a geometric phase, which is not present otherwise when we place the force harmonic oscillator in a commutative space time. So I will conclude that my forced harmonic oscillator placed in quantum space time generates a dilatation like term, gives rise to very phase. And when I switch off the non commutativity, it vanishes. And uh, uh, <clears throat> as I said before, that it was uh, shown that two separated harmonic oscillator states interacting via linearized gravitational fields. Gets entangled, gets entangled. And this indicates the nature of quantum nature of gra gravity seen in the non relativistic regime. So, one of my future work will be it will be interesting to study the effect of linearized gravity when it interacts with the safe system but placed in a non commutative space time. And uh, this is our group my supervisor, Vishuddhi Chakraborty, and my collaborator, Parthanundi, other colleague, Shayan Kumar Pal. I want to thank you for listening. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Questions, please. Comment. Yes. So just a very short question. So uh, you, you needed to work to, uh, with the worst product instead of model to have the positive uh, the density role, what uh, that was the, the, the motivation, no, the, the reason why you choose Warhol's product, right? Yes, yes, because my, in quantum mechanics, small star product has some problem, it does not give, give you P of M condition for quantum mechanics. That is why Warhol's. Okay, uh, more questions? Uh, there is something I don't have it clear. Uh, you start with function of x and t. Now everything you could do with x and t. Then you, you are talking in the non-commutative. In the non-commutative, mm -hmm. and then you represent this. Then you take the function of this x and uh, t, not, not commuting in a canonical way, and then you uh, promote them to an Hilbert space and uh, by with an inner product, uh, etc. But this is a highly irreducible. Uh, an highly reducible representation. You can do the same thing between X and T. Right. But then uh, you can represent A and uh, X and T on function of X and X and T. But there is a reason for which we don't do this and we use only L2 of the line or in Fourier transform the other one or the basis of this, which is Eisenberg principle. Right. And now I, I couldn't see this Eisenberg principle in your your presentation and there is an indetermination between x and t so that uh, when you're present on the Hilbert space there is a lot of redundancy if you do this so this i i couldn't see i'm not sure i understand your well, question I, I, I... yeah from a point on you were based on the fact that x and t equals equal to i hmm. okay then you could forget everything about non commutative geometry hmm. and do this on the third year for X and T, hmm. but then you were doing, so let's do it for quantum mechanics. Hmm. And so you have functions of X and T and everything, but we know that this is not the way to do quantum mechanics because that doesn't make any sense to a function of X and T. Hmm. And this is due to the fact that this representation as operators on an Hilbert space with GNS, you have to take a quotient that you have to and uh, so I don't, I didn't see this activity in your, uh, your presentation. Okay, so uh, I will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, yeah. We don't, don't, don't think T as a time or something, just two non commuting operators. And we can do that, right? Hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm. Okay, I understand. Hmm. 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 Yeah, yeah. do they enter just via combination, like in the if you T and uh, and uh, plus I of X, so they they so, but that's oh it's just notation I guess. It doesn't mean that they are that these are two independent variables. I guess. You, you mean yeah yeah. A theta. So the element if you are talking about the elements of a theta, okay. like, they are it's just notation. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. That's my input. Yeah, it, it, I, I am sorry because I didn't express that correctly, but yeah, it, that's good. Look at that one. The last one shows the digits of the Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, if there are no more questions, so thank you for the nice talk. And thank you. Have fun now. <laughs>